I'm going to transition us now to the first group of sessions that we have for you. These first sessions all center on the importance of care or mental health, both the significance to overall care or well-being and the impact of care or mental health on the ability of caregivers to continue to be partners in care for the people they support. As many of us know, mental health is a widespread concern for caregivers. We know that the work that caregivers do puts them at an increased risk for experiencing mental health disorders and emotional strain, including depression, anxiety, and burnout. But it's also the secondary stress that caregiving without adequate supports causes that also contributes to mental health strain for caregivers and their other life domains, like with family and at work. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us in the caregiving world saw a decline in the home and community-based services available to caregivers and families, putting carers at risk for social isolation and poor mental health outcomes. Indeed, caregivers have reported in the last year a decline in their overall health, increased stress and worry. Mental health is health and caregivers need support to care for themselves while providing care to someone else. The topics and upcoming speakers have prepared for you today will be both insightful and practical as we seek to better understand and positively impact CARES mental health and the work that we do across research, practice, and policy. In the upcoming hours, you'll hear from a number of leaders about the innovative programs they've developed to leverage learnings gained from providing remote support to carers throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. You'll also hear how your colleagues around the world are meeting specific service delivery challenges to support family caregivers remotely and in rural communities. You'll also hear about practical initiatives that target specific care populations, including adolescent caregivers and sibling caregivers. And finally, we'll dive into some particular topic areas within mental health and caregiving to learn more about ambiguous loss, a type of grief that caregivers may experience and need support around, and how to address care social isolation along with physical health as we learn about the CARES Active UK program and the unique partnerships that make that work possible. So let's kick off now with a care story from Nami Kadoma in Japan, who will share a piece of her caregiving journey with us, speaking to both the emotional highs and lows of caregiving and how that's impacted her mental health as a caregiver for her daughter. This is my daughter, her name is Umi, meaning the sea, the ocean in Japanese. She has profound disabilities, both physically and intellectually. When she was a baby, she got very often ill and it was hard on me. I was gradually getting depressed. And then one day I learned on the internet about Carers Week in England and Australia. I still remember some of the messages there. One goes, remember you are only human. It made me cry. I felt forgiven because there was so much I wanted to do for my baby, but simply couldn't. I was blaming myself for that. But now they say it is all right because I'm only human like everyone else. It saved my life. Now Umi is 34 years old, a jolly, beautiful woman. And I am a member of Kara's Japan. You bet I know Kara's need to be understood. Thank you, Mami Kadoma, for sharing your powerful words and images with us. We're going to keep sharing these care stories from the Global Voices of Caregiving project throughout today. But at this time, we're going to move to the next to a session addressing how Care Alliance Ireland is using technology and leveraging the learnings that they've gained from serving caregivers remotely throughout COVID-19 to serve family caregivers today. Rosemary Thanes Carney, a researcher at the University of Limerick, and Tara O'Connor, project coordinator for the Online Family Carer Support Group of Care Alliance Ireland, both from Ireland, 
were kind enough to pre-record a session for us, outlining the elements of their online peer support program and how it's meeting care needs by helping the carers engage to avoid social isolation and build networks for emotional and social support. It's a great program and Rosemary and Tara break down the components and practical considerations to give us a lot of takeaways. Others developing a program like this or enhancing a program they may already have can put to immediate use. So let's go now to that session, online support project for family carers in Ireland from COVID to now. Hello, my name is Tara O'Connor and I'm from Care Alliance Ireland. I am the project coordinator for the online family carer support pro group project. Just to note, here in Ireland, we use the term family carer, whereas some of you may use the term caregiver, just so you know what we are referring to. Hi, I'm Rosemary Danes Carney, and I'm a PhD researcher in the University of Limerick. I'm also a family carer for my husband and my son. And I'll be presenting today the preliminary findings from this first study of my PhD, where I interviewed 18 participants of the Care Alliance Ireland group. Just to note that the handouts will be circulated to you, and I have some quotes um, in the presentation, so you'll be able to read through those at your own leisure. Okay, so first we're going to go back to 2020. Prior to COVID, our organisation, Care Alliance, uh, worked mainly in the background on policy, research and supporting member organisations. We didn't work directly with family carers. But then COVID struck and everything changed. Daycare, respite care, face-to-face -face support groups all stopped, many overnight. It was a time of massive confusion, misinformation and fear, especially for family carers looking after a vulnerable loved one. Other organisations seemed to be very slow to respond. Very little was online in Ireland back then and everything was just cancelled. So Care Alliance saw the gap. Their small size and the support of the board allowed them to react quickly and pivot the focus of the organisation onto where it was needed. Before going into details of our online project, I just wanted to give you a very brief context of the COVID situation in Ireland. Here in Ireland, we have had some of the longest and toughest restriction in all of Europe including multiple extended lockdowns. In fact, many of our services are still not up and running, running again to this day, and those that have resumed tend to be at a very much reduced capacity. The impact of COVID came through very strongly in the interviews. It was described as a lonely time for carers. There were stories of families being separated so that they could protect their vulnerable loved ones from the virus. And as Tara said, the fear was very, very real. So the initial aims and um, the main objective was is to increase the well-being of family carers in Ireland and to reduce the negative impacts of caregiving, such as loneliness and isolation. We aim to provide reliable, trustworthy information, and that was especially important early in, in the pandemic. Also, the aim is to facilitate peer support so that carers don't feel so alone. They could interact with people who understood them, who got them, you know, and then to signpost to services and other organisations to let people know what is out there that may be of help to them. So our online family carer support project is run as a private group on the Facebook platform. So why Facebook? Well, we chose to go where the carers are. 72% of the Irish population still use Facebook. And the largest cohort of family carers in Ireland are women in the 35 to 54 age group. And that's an age cohort heavily represented in Ireland's Facebook user data. By using an existing platform like Facebook, it was the fastest and cheapest way to reach a large number of family carers quickly. But Facebook is not without its concerns, but we have tried to mitigate some of those by using the highest levels of privacy settings, 
We have questions and rules that members must answer and agree to before joining and very high levels of moderation and oversight. And here is a brief overview of our operations. Peer support is a central part of the group. There is nothing like talking with someone who understands your struggles, who has been in similar situations. Then we have professional guidance and referrals, and then the various activities that we offer, which I'll explain more about later. In the interviews, when we discussed the use of Facebook as the platform, there were a few negative perceptions about Facebook overall. And these centered around hate speech, misinformation, the use of personal data and privacy. But overall, it was a positive uh, experience for people because Facebook is easy and accessible for carers. It came up in many of the participants' timeline and they wouldn't have found it otherwise because they didn't know that there was any support out there. And it's available when the carer is available. And as one participant said, it's an example of how Facebook is useful when it works. To note that the cohort of the people I interviewed ranged between 35 and 77, and the average age was 55. 16 of the participants were female, and this really reflects the cohort of carers in Ireland, as Tara has said. So our volunteers are the heart of our group. They are made up of a mix of family carers and professionals from different areas, such as social worker, mental health, Having volunteers from different backgrounds has really facilitated a unique holistic element of support to the group. Our family care volunteers were all originally regular members of the group who we approached after seeing them respond supportively and with empathy to fellow members. In fact, that's how I myself became involved. Originally, I was a regular member of the group, a family carer looking after my mother-in-law. I became a volunteer and then eventually moved into this full-time staff role, which gives me a real unique perspective to add to the team. Our volunteers actively support members by sharing their knowledge and expertise and offering practical strategies to cope with challenges as they arise. All posts are pre-moderated and we have a seven day week rota. So someone is always on keeping an eye and approving posts. From the interviews, the role of moderators was very important for the participants in the group. They are seen to have a number of functions in to enable the group to be a, a safe space and for people to have positive benefits from the group. The first is that the moderators put up content, and this is not just the information content that Tara said is one of the key aims of the group, but also some fun and frivolous entertaining content that allowed carers to feel that caring isn't always just hard work and sad, but that it's actually there's fun times to be had as well. The moderators monitor content and comments, and as Tara said, every single post is pre-approved. And the amount of work that goes into this was recognised in the group and people said that it showed in the group um, and, and in how people interacted. There was positive modelling of behaviour by the moderators in how to deal with content as well. One person did comment that when their post wasn't approved, they weren't informed why, while others had, were, uh, said that they were told. And either way, what this highlights is that the communication in this process is important for transparency, to reduce confusion by carers or any inf ill feeling that might arise if their post isn't approved. Another role of the moderators was seen to manage group dynamics and to cre create the group safety. So the moderators were seen to walk a fine balance between allowing group users and group members to be honest and open about their experiences or what they were feeling, but also to ensure that the group rules were kept too and that nothing was posted that would offend anybody or would cause anybody to feel uncomfortable or to cause any fights or tension within the group. So there was a lot of responsibility for that. 
And I asked participants whether they themselves had had any neg negative experiences or if they had seen anything negative in the group. And really nobody had had any negative experiences or anything that they had seen that had been without posted that was uh, outside the group rules was dealt with very swiftly by the moderators. So we have a range of activities available, but they all have the one aim to encourage family carers to participate and reduce the loneliness and isolation often experienced by family carers. All of our activities are 100% online. This makes it so much more accessible for family carers. They don't need to worry about getting replacement care for their loved one or traveling to the nearest town. It's all available from home. For example, with our book club, we have found that the simple act of receiving a book in the post has a real positive impact on our members. Taking part in the book club can often give more introverted family carers an incentive to break through any initial hesitation they may have to engage with an online events, where they often end up having meaningful interactions and even forming friendships with other carers. The Garden Club is also extremely popular. We regularly send out seeds, which again, members love receiving something just for them, even if it's just a packet of lettuce seeds. Many studies have found that gardening can have a positive effect on your mental health. So with our Garden Club, you get two for one. You get the added benefit and encouragement to get out in the fresh air but also the opportunity to connect and engage with like-minded people who understand your life. We also collaborate with other organizations on various courses and educational talks. For example, at the moment, um, we're currently co-producing a six weeks health and wellness court, course with the organization Age and Opportunity. And again, this is all online. What really came out in the interviews was that the, these activities made the people feel like they were more than just a carer, but that they were a person first. And people really do love getting the little things in the post. It came up time and time again in the interviews. And what the impact of that was, was people really felt valued. They felt recognised. They felt their role of a carer had become visible and that people really recognised and valued what they were doing. And the group also allowed people to, to give back. Um, at Christmas time, there was a gift redistribution scheme where people could send in unwanted Christmas gifts. And this also had this positive impact of creating a sense of community and giving back. And what one person commented that in the Care Alliance world, it's the care that is coming forward. So the activities and the role of the moderator and all these personal touches really contributed to the feel of the group as being a tribe or a community. And many of the participants were also involved in other online groups. But the difference with this group was that they found this group to be very welcoming and uh, overarchingly very positive. In fact, they found it more welcoming than any other group that they had been in. They had a sense of understanding without having to explain. And this is really important for carers who often find that other people who aren't involved in caring, even if it's the family, just don't get it. So that this was a non-judgmental forum and it was a safe space, that there was no backlash. So in my research, what I'm looking at um, is social support and using Katrona and Shura's categorization of social support, we see three types of support coming out of this group. And the first is the informational support. And this is, again, from the information that the moderators would post, but also uh, by people just asking a question and receiving answers. And what was important here was that the answers were based on people's experiences. So they just weren't some rote things that came off a kind of a website, but these were tried and tested strategies that had worked for some people and that this had added value for the people in the group. This is a non-condition specific group and this was quite important for people because they 
many of the people in online groups were in condition specific groups and coming into a world where they were seeing caring from different perspectives, different conditions, different age of carers. And um, they found so much advice was given that they were able to take away these little nuggets that maybe was from a different condition, but applied to their own caring condition, uh, caring situation. And also the information allowed people to prepare for the future. So people who could see what their lives might be like, but also to take hope that they could see people in this online group were able to manage it. And so while many people joined the group to get information, this was a pathway into them receiving emotional support. And this could be just as simple as putting up a post saying that they were having a really bad day and people responding with care and compassion and empathy. And also people received positive benefits from being able to give support to people and reaching out to people when they saw posts of people going up who were having bad days or in bad situations. And one person described it as having a conversation with people who aren't in your home and the value of just having somebody ask how their your day went. And for some people who were really quite active in the group, and as Tara said, this has led to friendships being formed. So the social networking and the connection that goes beyond just being uh, in an online group that some people have made their best friends, even though they've never met these people, they talk to them every day. And that the activities have in themselves become a pillar of uh, somebody's week where they clear out their calendar and make sure that for that time on the Friday or for the coffee morning that they make sure that they drop everything else and that they attend that event for themselves. Yes, so we currently have over 3,200 members. Uh, membership continues to increase at the same steady rate despite the slow reopening of face-to-face -face support services. There's been no slowdown in, in our membership. One benefit of using the Facebook platform is that we have access to Facebook anal analytics. So we're able to know that 96% of those who were a member in April 2021 are still a member today in April 22. If you compare that to first versus traditional face-to-face -face support groups where dropout rate can be as high as 50%. We do also have extremely high engagement levels. 89% of members have been active in the last 28 days. Now, Facebook defines a user as active when they like, comment or engage with a post in the group. So 89% is an astounding participation rate. In terms of engagement, it's really helpful to hear how Facebook analytics define engagement. And one of the things I'm interested in is whether there's a threshold that of engagement that needs to be met for somebody to get positive benefits out of engaging in this online support group. And actually what came out of the interviews is that this is actually a very low threshold that for many people, just being part of the group is actually enough for them to feel supported and to get something out of it. Um, in an online context, many of you might know this term lurker, which can often have a kind of negative connotation or something nefarious going on. And actually in the interviews, this term came up where um, people de described it not as lurking, but as reading. And actually just that people are reading the comments and that this is very positive and it enables them to feel supported. So I discussed this with one self-described lurker and gave him feedback about what other members of the group had said about people who read the posts, but don't like or comment or engage with the posts beyond that and they took that as very positive reinforcement for themselves and they said actually yeah I get an awful lot out of the comments that come up so even though a reader it helps to know that the group is there. There were some facilitators to engagement that have come out uh, been identified out of the research. The first is the level of anonymity and this is a physical anonymity that you're in a group. It's not local to your environment. Ireland is quite a small country and everybody knows everybody. And people didn't want to engage in something that was too close to home. 
but also even though uh, in the in Facebook people may know your name or they may see your picture they don't actually know who you are and people said this just makes it easier to share something that you wouldn't necessarily share in another context there's a level of autonomy by carers about how to get involved. So nobody is forced to do anything. You can join the group and do nothing else, or you can get involved in as many activities as, you're li as you like. But this is left to the carer to decide and to engage in the support depending on their own caring situation. And also, as we've discussed, the group rules and privacy understanding is really important. So a number of participants described how they would observe what is happening within the group before deciding whether they would engage further or whether they would post their own comments or questions. And it was down to the group moderation and the positive modelling by other group members that encouraged them to get involved themselves. A number of barriers uh, to engagement were also identified and the biggest of this is social comparison. So some carers felt that maybe they weren't caring enough that really in, compared to other people in the group, you know, they shouldn't be in the group or they shouldn't be getting the lovely parcels in the post or, or engaging in the activities. Some other people um, identified short-term carers, and these were maybe parents who had children with long-term needs. And so caring for 15 years was short-term, but 50 years was long-term. And so they found it difficult to relate to people in different caring situations. One person said that the group reinforced their own feeling of isolation and guilt and loneliness when their post that they put up didn't get as many likes or comments or engagement as other posts that they had seen go up. A few people found it hard to engage in the group activities, and these were really newer members who had joined the group, um, you know, during the years and had gone to group activities where there was already a sense of camaraderie and banter going on with people who had met uh, on a number of occasions, and they found it difficult to break into that um, in the online context. And for one person, they felt their expectations had not been met, that they had a different understanding of what the group would be when they joined us. In looking at the use of the technology uh, in, in the online group, everybody really felt that Facebook was a really positive way to have the online support group hosted on. But in terms of the video conferencing, this was more challenging for a number of the people I interviewed. One of the things is that Zoom, you have to be physically present and it's like having to go to a, a physical face-to-face -face group. And also there's a limited kind of amount of people that can effectively engage in a group activity online. And so that this was difficult for some people. Other carers found just using the technology overwhelming. They were in a stressful caring situation at a stressful time and just trying to get their head around the use of a video conferencing tool was just too much for them. And for one or two people, they just prefer a physical group and just said, look, online, it's not for me. Okay. So last year we did a snapshot poll of our members and we asked, prior to COVID-19, were you involved in any face-to-face -face support groups? And the results really surprised us. 91% of our members had no prior engagement in face-to-face -face support groups. So this really indicates there's a large cohort of family carers out there that were underserved by the traditional face-to-face -face support models. This indicates to us that the need for the group will still be there post-COVID-19. The online format just really does suit some people better. Yes, and this came out in the research as well, where online does suit people better. And as we've discussed this, this geographical distance where it's not local, you can you can go to somewhere that's kind of out there in, in space as opposed to in your local community centre, but also the flexibility that online offers. So one person described having to drive one hour each way to attend a physical support group. And if they missed it, they felt a sense of responsibility because the group was small and maybe they had taken up a space for that somebody else could use. In this online environment where there's a lot of people, carers have been uh, enabled to identify what type of supports works for them and then to engage in it in the way that's effective for them to receive positive benefits from it. Yeah. 
Now, we try to be aware of the potential challenges and limitations that we may face so that we can try and mitigate any impact they may have on the project. So obviously a big one is relying on an external platform on, on Facebook, because Facebook could shut down tomorrow for all we know. But uh, we do have a backup list with our members' contact details. So if we have to move to a separate platform, at least we'll be able to contact them and advise them of the new location. The need for ongoing funding is, is always an issue. Um, we're fortunately in a very good position right now. We've just signed a service level agreement with the HSE, which is our Irish government health service executive. But in the future, we might need to look for other funding sources. The group size is a very important one. As the group grows, it's important that we don't lose that personal, friendly feeling of it. We have made a conscious decision to not advertise or chase numbers, so to speak, but to just let it grow organically through word of mouth. The larger the group, the more moderators we need, the more volunteers, etc. And it will be important to keep moderation consistent and to make sure that you can still form relationships with people. With the volunteers, we are amazingly fortunate. We have the most amazing volunteers and most of them have been with us since 2020, but people will move on by their very nature. So we try to bring new volunteers on board at regular intervals so that they are training and getting experience from the more seasoned volunteers. Training and support for our volunteers is very important especially those with caring roles themselves. Recently, we had a series of training sessions with our volunteers around self-care and mitigating the impact of vicarious trauma. We are committed to provide ongoing training like this in the future and support our volunteers to the best of our ability. The biggest challenge that was identified in the interviews was that of the growth of the group. People were concerned that as it gets bigger, that it doesn't lose the magic or that people just don't get lost in the group in general. And that for some, there were some fairly dominant people in the group and that this may be difficult for those who are new to the group to find their feet with, this do with these dominant members. Now, Tara has already said how Care Alliance Ireland are looking to address these challenges in their group. But these are questions really for anybody who's looking to set up or who, who is running an online support group about how to manage the group getting better, bigger, how to manage expectations and how to build relationships with new people who join. Now, I did ask people about the impact of the, uh, on them if the group were to close, and I quickly learned to frame this as a hypothetical question because people got really worried about it, which indicates um, how important the group is to them. That for people, it would break a lifeline. It would bring them back into social isolation because they would lose the connection of the emotional and the practical support, the sense of community. And this group for many people is a coping mechanism as well. And it helps them to cope with their caring situation on a day to day basis. So this raises the question of sustainability of online support groups and questions around succession planning. So in this group, there's a very strong relationship between the moderators and the group. And so, as Tara said, there's a question about how to manage people leaving or the turnover of people. And one suggestion that came out of the group was to have little bios about the moderators, particularly if the moderators have caring experience, because a number of participants raise that as being important to them to know that, and that this can help new members to know who the moderators are if they haven't been there um, before. As Tara have said, that the use of volunteer moderators is really important in the group, um, but this does change their relationship within the group. And so support for them is important in both their caring role and in their moderation role. And also participants were c concerned about funding. What would happen to the group if funding was, um, was lost? Mm -hmm. So in, initially in 2020, we were funded by the Community Foundation of Ireland and also smaller grants from the National Lottery. Just recently, we have the HSC, which is our government health service, have agreed to fund the project on an annual recurring basis, which is amazing. 
you know, that's recognition of the value that our project provides and also means that the project is sustainable going into the future. Um, and that, susp that sustainability is really important. So I used semi-structured interviews uh, in the research process, and these are open-ended questions that enable people to talk freely about their experience. Although, and although maybe some people had uh, one or two negative feedback comments about the group, I was amazed at overwhelmingly how positive the feedback was and the impact um, that this group has had on people's lives. It has a feel-good factor that really brightens people's days up. It provides social, educational and self-care activities. And these activities are about the carer. They encourage them to find something for themselves and help people to feel recognised, visible and valued. Some people have described it as an encyclopedia, that the information is there when it's needed. And this was one of the key benefits of using the Facebook platform, because not all information is relevant at the time it's posted, but it may be later on in the caring journey. And a number of people described bookmarking pages or using the search function to go back and find information when it was relevant to them. As one person said, everybody's experience is somebody else's resource. The group also inspired personal growth and change in a number of people that I interviewed. It encouraged them to open up and talk about their caring experience, which is something they hadn't done before, and also to find their voice, to find what they needed to help them and support them, and to also set boundaries around what didn't work and support them. And one person described it as a lifeline and life changing as well. So we've come to the end of our presentation now, and we want to thank you for the time you've taken to listen to us today. My second study in my PhD is an online survey looking at engagement or non-engagement in online support groups. And I'd like to invite you, if you're a carer yourself, or if you work with family carers, to share the survey link and to complete the survey. Um, my Twitter details and my email details are there as well, if you need or want to get in contact for anything else. And if you would like to find out any more information about Care Alliance Ireland and the various family care support programmes that we run, please visit us at our website there and our Twitter is also there. And then if you do have any questions about the online family care support project, please feel free to contact me via email at Tara at Care Alliance. And thank you so much for your time and attention. I want to thank um, our presenters from Care Alliance Ireland, Rosemary and Tara, for sharing an inside look at the Care Alliance Ireland online family care support group program. Um, we got a couple of questions from the audience about the availability of the handout, um, as well as these slides. So the handout is in the chat box now. You can um, grab that link, that document there, and NAC will provide these slides um, that the speaker shared with us um, on our website in the upcoming weeks. So if you if you're with us now, um, we will link you if you're on Facebook and we'll send you a direct email if you're here on Zoom to those slides. So we can share those with you and we'll do that. Um, any questions now? We do have about a minute. Um, if you have questions, drop those in the chat box or that Q&A area now. Um, we have Rosemary um, actually with us here on the call. Um, and she can answer one or two questions about the research, um, if you have any questions related to that research. I'm going to take a quick look at the question box. Um, so there's a question here about sharing a link to the published article that was referenced um, by Rosemary. So um, what we'll do is, is try to get that for you after today, um, Monica. So thanks for that question about that publication. Um, these presenters shared some contact information with you. So if other questions about this presentation come up for you um, after today or later today, um, feel free to go ahead and, and connect with them and reach out. So thanks again to that group for their presentation.
I think you're going to hear some of the themes present in this session throughout the day, uh, embracing flexibility, engaging care input, um, and meeting caregivers where they're at, so in the case of this support group online. Um, and just a reminder that Rosemary and Tara's session, along with all the sessions you're going to hear today, are being recorded, and we're going to share that recording with you once it becomes available to you in the upcoming weeks. Um, my colleague Lauren now is going to introduce us to the next Global Voices of Caregiving story. So Lauren, I want to go over to you, and I also know that some of you have been sharing stories with us via Twitter. So if we have an extra minute here, Lauren, uh, why don't we go ahead and take a look at, at Twitter and, and share some of the stories that all of you have been sharing using that, our event hashtags, um, WCC22 and World Carers. Thanks, Christine, for, for sharing an image about caregiving with us. We're just scrolling through here. Here's one from the Caregiver Club. Um, thank you, National Alliance for Caregiving. I'm a caregiver to my mom with Alzheimer's and co-founded a nonprofit caregiver club to support caregivers in the dementia community. And, and they sell caregiver cards and fun caregiver respite initiatives. So thanks, Caregiver Club, for sharing that image. And we have another one here on multi-generational caregiving. Um, Beth shared a picture here of her dad and her daughter together, helping each other in so many ways. Very cool. So we're gonna keep looking for these stories to share them with all of you. If you'd like to be part of that Global Voices of Caregiving project and share an image, um, that speaks to your caregiving experience and your vision for a world that includes caregivers. Um, use those hashtags WCC22 and Care a Story, um, and we'll be keeping an eye on those on Twitter. So now I think Lauren's going to introduce you to um, the next story in our Global Voices of Caregiving project and share that with you. Yes, thank you, Lauren Rachel. So this next story is a care from Israel. Um, she's going to, there's no audio, so it's a text story. Um, and she is going to tell you about how she cares for her mother long distance who lives in France. Thank you for sharing in that story, Lauren. And thank you, Anat, for that story about you and your mother. 
when we talk today about caregiving transcending bounds and borders, I think Anat's story is a great example of this. And in fact, um, while capturing these photos um, in this spring for Global Voice of Caregiving, I think Anat was actually traveling from Israel to France to be with her mother. Um, if you want to share your own photo story, you can do that by posting a picture to Twitter or Facebook that represents your vision for a world that includes and supports caregivers. And if you want to see it here, be sure to tag us at NAC using our handle. Um, we're at NA, the number four caregiving, and use the hashtags WorldCarers and WCC22. As we move ahead, we have come up to the first decision point where attendees on Zoom have a choice to make about the next session that you would like to attend. So if you're joining us via Facebook Live, or if you stay right here where you are on Zoom, you're going to hear a session next from Tracy Sinowitz, the director at the Alabama Lifespan Respite Program, about how her organization in the United States is delivering caregiver supports to underserved caregivers in rural communities. If you're on Zoom, you'll have a choice to attend an alternative session at the same time. And we have two fantastic options. The first is to follow the link I'll provide in the chat box shortly to view a pre-recorded session from Patrick Nock, the manager of the Carers Active Project at Carers UK. Patrick is going to talk about why physical activity is so important for carers and their overall health and how it's linked um, to carer health. He's also going to share details about his program that will hopefully spark interest in adoption elsewhere. Um, so that's one option. Your final option, um, if you're with us on Zoom, is to explore the concept of ambiguous loss, a specific type of grief with significance to caregivers. Um, and your presenter for that session is Courtney Sand. Um, Courtney is a neuro resource facilitator at the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa in the United States. Courtney is a licensed and board certified behavior analyst and certified brain injury specialist trainer. With more than 20 years of experience in the field of applied behavior analysis and mental health and disability in both children and adults across a variety of settings. She's going to share information on how to recognize and understand ambiguous loss and also how to support carers around this experience. So if you're on Facebook or you're on Zoom and you want to hear about supporting rural caregivers with Tracy Sinowitz in the United States, hang tight. We're going to hear that session in just a moment. But if you're on Zoom and you're interested in more information on carers active or ambiguous loss in caregiving, watch the chat box area. I'm going to drop links to you to leave this meeting and catch those bonus sessions. So if you do leave us to catch one of those sessions, don't forget to use your Zoom meeting information to rejoin me here right after. You'll be leaving this Zoom meeting and you'll have to go back to that Zoom invitation to rejoin us and link back up with our live program. But no matter what session you attend, the links to the others you miss are going to remain available to you for viewing another time. And we're also going to provide this entire recording and all the bonus sessions to attendees in the upcoming weeks, so you won't miss a minute. Um, we're going to now hear that session from Tracy, Mental Health Supports for Underserved Caregivers in Rural Alabama, USA. And while my colleague Lauren sets that up for us, I'm going to head to the chat box and share the links to those alternative sessions I discussed. So I'll hang around in the chat box if anyone needs more help. Um, and I know we're asking you to make a hard decision. So um, if you're staying with us and going to hear that session on um, serving rural caregivers, but you want to grab those links to the other sessions, you can do that too. Those links to those alternative sessions are going to stay active after this, so you can watch those um, in your own time. Greetings from Huntsville, Alabama, USA. I'm Tracy Sinowitz, and I have worked in the disability field for 15 years with United Cerebral Palsy of Huntsville which is a nonprofit serving individuals across the lifespan who represent 180 diagnoses, their caregivers, and the community professionals who work alongside them. I have had the distinct privilege of serving as UCP Huntsville's statewide director of the Alabama Lifespan Respite Program since 2018. Alabama Lifespan Respite serves full-time unpaid family caregivers of, an, of individuals with a chronic illness or disability who require full-time care. Our caregiver services and supports include planned and emergency respite reimbursement, free online and on-site caregiver education, free online respite provider training, respite awareness, resources and referrals, 
technical assistance for startup or expansion of community-based respite services, state, local, and federal advocacy, and the Caregiver Wellness Initiative, which we will discuss today. We also partner with the Alabama Department of Senior Services, Alabama Area Agency on Aging, Alabama Department of Mental Health, and the Alabama Department of Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention to deliver personal choice option respite to caregivers statewide. Alabama Lifespan Respite, established in the year 2000, is an administration on community living federal lifespan respite grant recipient and a member of the ARCH National Respite Network. Thank you to the National Alliance for Caregiving and Embracing Caregivers for this opportunity to share our program's efforts to provide mental health supports for underserved caregivers. It's no secret that caregivers are a population at risk for emotional, mental, and physical health problems. According to research reported by the Family Caregiver Alliance, caregivers show higher levels of depression Caregivers suffer from higher levels of stress and frustration. Female caregivers are at a much higher risk of mental and physical health consequences than their male counterparts. Stressful caregiving situations may lead to harmful behaviors, including increased alcohol and substance abuse. Caregivers have, a low, have lower levels of self-care. Elderly caregivers have a 63% higher mortality rate than non-caregivers the same age. It's evident that mental health is critical to the well-being at every age and stage of life, but especially as a caregiver. Research shows that supporting caregivers with information and resources can help them maintain and improve their mental health, which is the core of Alabama Lifespan's Respite's mission as seen here, which is to increase access to and availability of high quality respite resources for caregivers in Alabama. Through one-on-one -on -one caregiver supports and surveys of approximately 2,000 caregivers served statewide, Alabama Lifespan Respite identified lack of emotional and mental health supports for caregivers in underserved populations as a growing problem prior to the spring of 2020 but this deficiency was amplified in the wake of the pandemic. In response, Alabama Lifespan Respite quickly developed and implemented a variety of indirect and direct mental health supports for caregivers statewide, but especially those identified as underserved, including veterans, minorities, the elderly, and residents in rural and medically underserved areas of Alabama. The intent of these supports is to decrease caregiver stress, anxiety, fatigue, and burnout, resulting in an increase of overall caregiver wellness, as well as potentially to help prevent premature out-of-home placement of their care recipient. Today, I will share examples of these indirect and direct mental health supports for replication or to possibly inspire ideas to create similar mental health supports for underserved caregivers in your communities. So how did we further identify the need for mental health supports in 2020? Respite staff made welfare phone calls to check in on approximately 800 caregivers on our program during the height of the pandemic. Respite staff quickly learned that stress was running high, nerves were wearing thin, and some caregivers, especially those in rural areas, might go for days or even weeks without talking to anyone other than their care recipient. This slide represents words and phrases we heard repeatedly when we asked caregivers, how are you doing? Caregivers were tired. They were overwhelmed. They were stressed, unhappy, angry. They felt alone and some felt judged by other family members for seemingly doing either too much or too little for their care recipient. While most caregivers said they simply needed and wanted someone to talk with, 
many caregivers also express the need for professional mental health support. Simultaneously, our applications for emergency respite began to significantly increase, citing overwhelming stress, burnout, and mental health crisis for, as reason for application. One of the wonderful things about the Alabama Lifespan Respite Program is our ability to respond to caregiver needs in real time. So we immediately began offering scheduled care chats for caregivers to talk with one of three social workers on our staff for up to 30 minutes each week by phone or by Zoom. Care chats were slow to catch on at first, but when they did, our staff stayed busy providing this one-on-one -on -one support, especially to elderly caregivers in rural areas. Some caregivers were more comfortable interacting via social media than one-on-one -on -one via phone or Zoom. So we also posted what we called care chat topic videos, like the one seen here, called The Power of Positivity, where caregivers were encouraged to tell us something good on a rainy day. This was a particularly effective outreach and support tool for younger caregivers who receive information primarily via Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. We did a few TikTok videos too. Those were a lot of fun. This is just a sample of our care chat feedback that I wanted to share. One caregiver said, thank you for just being there for us. Another said, you help me vent when I need to and release my own anxiety. Your unselfishness to listen to me is more than you could know. It's huge. It truly is. You may not think it's much, but it's the simple things that stand, up, stand out shining brighter than you'd ever expect. So the takeaway from our care chats, while we aren't mental health professionals ourselves, this was an indirect or soft support that we could provide as compassionate respite professionals. It also gave us one-on-one -on -one time with our caregivers to hear more about their caregiving journeys and then connect them with additional resources, referrals, and supports as needed. Participation and response to care chats was extremely positive for caregivers who just needed a little extra support but many caregivers were still experiencing mental health crises. Therefore, Alabama Lifespan Respite began seeking grant support to provide additional emergency respite voucher reimbursement funds, as well as new funds specifically for mental health counseling, which we'll talk a little bit about later. It goes without saying that grant seeking is often a long process. So Alabama Lifespan Respite continued to expand our indirect mental health supports through existing funded program services until direct mental health supports could be funded. We brainstormed as a staff and talked about things that personally make us happy when we need support. And the conversation kept circling back to acts of giving. We learned during Mental Health Awareness Month in May that being in nature, breathing fresh air, and feeling the sunshine on your skin are simple but important ways to support mental health. So Alabama Lifespan Respite staff created and mailed summer fun caregiver care packages to nearly 300 caregivers on our program in the most rural and isolated areas of the state. We gifted them with flower seeds to plant, sunglasses, a hand fan because uh, Alabama's summers are pretty hot, uh, a bright yellow package of juicy fruit gum, which smelled amazing when they opened the box, and a few fun activities to do on the porch while sipping lemonade. We wanted to engage all of their senses and encourage them to take a physical and mental health break when they had the opportunity. The care packages were a total surprise for our caregivers. They had no idea they were coming, so it was something fun to find in the mailbox. We received so many phone calls, emails, and cards from caregivers who were very grateful to have received them. As this slide illustrates, the caregivers who previously said they felt unhappy now had something to brighten their day. 
The caregivers who said they felt alone now knew that someone was thinking of them. The caregivers who felt judged now knew that encouragement and support were available to them in their caregiving journey. The takeaway, the care packages weren't groundbreaking or innovative, but they were certainly an effective and meaningful indirect mental health support tool. I kept each thank you card and email that we received just to remind us that small acts of kindness can make a big impact. Our next indirect mental health support effort was the creation of care cards to remind caregivers that not only are we thinking about you, but we think you're pretty amazing. The front of the card states, you're the best. And inside tells the caregiver, you are a treasure, a modern day angel, a warrior when times are tough, a soothing balm when there is pain, a shining light when there is darkness. Today and every day, we celebrate you for being a wonderful caregiver. The back of each card has our contact information and a list of caregiver resources and supports available through our program, just as a reminder. These cards were mailed to approximately 250 caregivers on our program who were elderly, veterans, and or minorities in more urban areas of our state. We continue to use these cards daily when we interact by phone or email with a caregiver and can tell that they're having a particularly hard day in their caregiving journey. We sometimes even include a $5 gift card for a sweet treat or a cup of coffee. The response to the care cards was immediate and positive, with so many caregivers expressing that it's just nice to be thought of. The takeaway? Again, care chat cards are not innovative or groundbreaking, but they do offer a meaningful and effective indirect mental health support to caregivers. Sometimes they just need to be reminded of the positive difference they're making in the lives of their care recipients. So that's what we hope to achieve with the care cards. The last indirect mental health support I will share with you today is what I'm sure you will agree is the least original. Support groups have been around for ages, but the pandemic either shut them down completely or brought them from in-person to online. We too pivoted and converted our monthly in-person caregiver break support group from on-site locally to online statewide. With so much negativity in the world at the time, we decided to shift the focus of breaks from solely discussing caregiver issues to doing something totally different. Our staff got very creative to offer broad support through fun group activities with other caregivers. During our breaks, we have played bingo, gone on scavenger hunts, virtual scavenger hunts, <laughs> decorated holiday cookies, had sing-alongs, and we've even had a murder mystery party. These have been a huge success because activities are joyful and provide caregivers with the opportunity to connect their peers statewide during and in between events. Those natural supports are so important for caregivers and the statewide group enabled them to expand their support circle. The takeaway, the pandemic presented an opportunity for us to reimagine a tried but true mental health support and improve upon its delivery. While we have returned to on-site support groups locally, we have decided as a team to continue offering the online group as well and to keep each month's focus on fun, positive experiences for our caregivers who need and want a break from their caregiving roles, even if it's just for one hour a month. While each of these indirect mental health supports helped underserved caregivers deal with the sudden loss of respite breaks and the intense isolation as a result of the pandemic, many caregivers were still in need of direct mental health support. Our first direct mental support effort was to drastically increase the amount of caregiver mental health education opportunities we offered weekly, both live and recorded, to caregivers statewide. Topics include caregiver depression and anxiety, emotional wellness, 
how stress affects your mental and physical health, anticipatory grief, and much more as seen here. We also offer respite stipends to enable caregivers to participate in education opportunities while a respite provider cares for their care recipient. Approximately 1,200 caregivers to date have participated in caregiver mental health education opportunities statewide since 2020. All caregiver education is offered online and on-site in community settings as pandemic restrictions have been lifted. Caregiver mental health education is presented by both Alabama Lifespan Respite Educators and mental health professionals. Through this partnership with our mental health professionals, Alabama Lifespan Respite began to build a statewide list of licensed mental health providers who are familiar with caregiver and disability related mental health issues. This list was utilized in our most direct mental health support for underserved caregivers, the Caregiver Wellness Initiative. So what is the Caregiver Wellness Initiative? As I mentioned earlier, earlier we wanted to be able to support the total well-being of our unpaid full-time family caregivers statewide. So we established the Caregiver Wellness Initiative to provide funds specifically for free mental health counseling to caregivers currently enrolled with any one of our Alabama Lifespan Respite reimbursement programs. So if they are receiving respite through any one of the funding streams where we provide respite reimbursement for personal choice option respite, then they are eligible to apply for free mental health counseling. If they are not enrolled with our program, we will get you enrolled and then you'll be eligible to apply for these caregiver wellness funds as well. So why is it needed? Again, the intent is to decrease caregiver stress, anxiety, fatigue, and burnout, resulting in an increase of overall caregiver wellness, so physical, mental, and emotional, as well as possibly helping to prevent that premature out-of-home placement of the care recipient. We know that our care recipients want to stay at home as long as possible, and as caregivers, we have to keep ourselves healthy be able to be able to make that possible. So that is one of our biggest goals with this, is to help prevent that premature out-of-home placement. So how do caregivers learn about it? Well, our CWI information has been shared via direct mail and email, so we have mailed out information packets about it with applications to uh, all of the caregivers on our program. We have information on our website. We have shared through our own social media as, we're, as well as our agency partner's social media. Again, through social media, we've, we've tried to hit uh, all age groups. We have shared through Facebook, Instagram, um, I don't think TikTok, but uh, you know, Twitter, we want to meet caregivers where they are, no matter how, um, you know, if, how they receive their information. We have also uh, been featured in print and television news. So this has, this has been in local newspapers. We've uh, been, on, been fortunate to be on the news a couple of times to be able to share this information. Those respite education opportunities I mentioned earlier, we have a lot that, as I said, is very specific to mental health education for caregivers, but we have a lot of general caregiver education too. So at every one of those opportunities, we tell our caregivers who are in attendance about CWI. We also have some great agency partners like the ones I mentioned earlier, as well as a coalition of state partners throughout Alabama who help us share this information with those who are currently enrolled in our program as well as new applicants. And when caregivers apply for our respite reimbursement program, there if they haven't heard of CWI, there's actually a place on the application to indicate if they would like more information about mental health supports and counseling. If they answer yes, we follow up with each caregiver accordingly and provide them with that information. So how is this all funded? Those grant seeking efforts I mentioned earlier paid off. Uh, CWI is now funded by federal, state, and local grant funds. 
And this is something we hope is sustainable and can continue for a very long time. So how does the program work? When we receive an application for CWI, eligible caregivers will receive at least one stipend good for three counseling sessions per calendar year to be used with a licensed mental health provider in Alabama. As I said earlier, Alabama Lifespan maintains a statewide list of available licensed mental health providers who are familiar with caregiver and disability-related mental health issues as part of this initiative. Caregivers may choose a provider from this list, or they can choose any licensed mental health provider in Alabama who is available in person or via telehealth who accepts direct payment for services rendered. So if a caregiver already has a mental health professional in their community that they're comfortable with and they're not on our list, as long as they accept direct payment, we make contact with that provider. We ask them their rates, we tell them about our program, and we have them direct all the billing to us for an, initially for three sessions. At that point, Alabama Lifespan Respite will pay the mental health provider directly up to the awarded stipend amount for services rendered to the caregiver. Caregivers are asked to complete anonymous pre and post counseling surveys to help us determine the effectiveness of the program. Uh, as part of those grants, this is part of our evaluation and you know, of our outcomes, you know, is this really working? So we continue, can continue getting those grant funds. Um, so this, like I said, completely anonymous, completely voluntary. They do not have to uh, complete these pre and post surveys and we let them know that in advance. But so far, the vast majority of our caregivers have done this for us. They realize it's an important resource and this is how we get our funding. So they wanna do everything they can to help us continue to be able to offer this to caregivers statewide. And caregivers who express a need may also be eligible to receive receive technology if they want to access their counseling sessions via telehealth. So we got another small grant from a national partner that enabled us to buy Wi-Fi enabled tablets that are Zoom ready. Um, so if a caregiver says, I, you know, I, I have internet, but I, I don't have a tablet or a smartphone or anything like that to be able to set to access this telehealth, then we will help make that a reality for them. And all of this information is available on our website under the Caregiver Wellness Initiative link. Since we aren't live today, I'm gonna to share the questions we are most frequently asked about the Caregiver Wellness Initiative in hopes that might answer any questions you have. So the first question is, do caregivers only get three counseling sessions? The short answer is no. They begin with three sessions and if mutually agreed upon by both the caregiver and the mental health professional, that more sessions are needed to stabilize a caregiver mental health crisis, then we will award more sessions as needed. And each stipend is good for three sessions. So we will award, you know, an additional stipend as needed until that caregiver is stabilized. Next question, how many caregivers need more than three sessions? We currently have only had four caregivers total who have requested additional and received additional counseling beyond the initial three sessions. So how did we decide to start with three sessions? Um, that group of mental health professionals that we have entered into these partnerships with, as I mentioned before, uh, we, we did a lot of research and we talked with them and we talked with other agencies who are able to offer mental health support to um, individuals on their programs. And, you know, we said, where do we start? And this was a very mutually agreed upon number of sessions. And again, a lot of times it's just to stabilize the caregiver and to get them out of that crisis mental health situation. So we decided, you know, based on all of the information and the recommendations from mental health professionals and other agencies that we work with, that three would be a good starting point. And so far that has uh, worked upon, worked out pretty well. So how much does each session cost? The cost varies per 
provider, but we receive those rates in advance through a memorandum of understanding or MOU with each provider on our list. And this helps tremendously for budgeting. Um, you know, the MOU just says to them, you know, give us your rates, let us know you're available, and uh, we are committing to making the payment for, you know, this amount of, of sessions. And we have a referral form attached with that. So it just makes, it legitimizes everything. It makes both the provider and the caregiver uh, feel, you know, good about this is going to be paid for, it doesn't go through insurance or anything like that. So um, that's how we work that out. Uh, what kind of technology do you provide to caregivers? Again, as I said before, uh, we give them that uh, Wi-Fi enabled Zoom ready tablet, but we also provide one-on-one -on -one tech support to get them started using their technology if needed. Were you worried that caregivers wouldn't accept the help and apply for free mental health counseling? Yes, <laughs> we were, but to our delight and surprise, as soon as mental health counseling stipends were made available, applications began to pour in. And how many caregivers have received mental health counseling so far? Since February 21, 179 caregivers statewide have been awarded mental health counseling stipends. Alabama Lifespan Respites, a state grant partner, the Alabama Department of Senior Services, collects and analyzes evaluation information to officially determine whether um, you know, these mental health stipends are achieving their intended purpose. However, we can already see that this direct mental health support for underserved caregiving is making a positive difference. In fact, since September of 21, requests for emergency respite due to overwhelming stress, burnout, and mental health crisis have decreased by 90%. Uh, so we think that's pretty amazing. The takeaway, as I mentioned earlier, lack of emotional and mental health supports for underserved family caregivers was a growing problem prior to 2020. As a result, Alabama Lifespan Respite was able to identify opportunities to respond to emerging caregiver needs, reimagine traditional respite, and create new indirect and direct caregiver mental health supports that will be impactful well beyond the pandemic. Thank you for allowing me to share these examples of indirect and direct mental health supports for underserved caregivers. I hope this information has been a helpful tool to replicate or inspire similar supports in your communities. To learn more about Alabama Lifespan Respite or to contact our agency, please visit us online at alabamarespite.org. Thank you, Tracy, for your session. And I've shared through the chat box that Tracy has actually joined us live, and we only have a few minutes before we move to um, our next session. But Tracy has um, offered to answer a question live for us. Hi, Tracy. Um, we can see you now, and you can come off mute um, when you're ready, and we'll hear you too. We got a number of questions um, in the question Q&A area, and I see that you've been typing responses, but um, one question that we have that maybe you could answer for us live um, is about your programs program and whether you have any bilingual programs or services and outreach materials, um, in particular for Spanish speaking carers or any other languages that might be a part of your community in Alabama. We actually do. All of our um, all of our materials that we share with our caregivers are available in Spanish, and uh, we work closely with um, a local agency who's one of our agency partners, and they do real time translation for us. So anytime we have a caregiver call um, or email or however they contact us, uh, they provide that translation service on site, and uh, you know just immediately. So yes, we do offer everything available in Spanish. Thank you for sharing more information on that. Um, will you be around um, in the chat area to answer some of these other questions about really? your program via text? Yes. Well, thanks for doing that. Um, so we'll, um, if you submitted a question and Tracy hasn't answered that yet, I see a few of you um, in the Q&A area, um, we'll coordinate during the next session to, to make sure that Tracy can see those and, and get you an answer for that. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you.
I also want to thank Courtney and Patrick for their respective sessions and encourage everyone watching to come back to the sessions you didn't attend when NAC makes these recordings available to you by email. Those links to having but not having, navigating ambiguous loss as a caregiver, and the Carers Active Project with Carers UK are still in the chat on Zoom. And Zoom Zoom attendees can click and save those links now. I'll also share them again in case they've got lost in your chat feed. But don't worry, we'll send those links back around to everyone here on Zoom and also provide access through NAC's Facebook page at a later date. It's time now to hear another CARA story from the Global Voices of Caregiving Project, this time from Vinicius in Brazil. Vinicius is a young caregiver for his girlfriend. We'll now go to his story, Envision of a World that Supports and Includes Caregivers. Olá, tudo bem? Meu nome é Vinícius, eu tenho 25 anos, sou brasileiro, eu moro em São José do Rio Preto, interior de São Paulo, Brasil. Eu sou cuidador há 3 anos da Beatriz Suzuki, minha namorada, diagnosticada com câncer coloretal, que eu a conheci ainda ostomizada. Procurei mostrar, através das fotos, um pouco do que a gente passou nos últimos anos, o tratamento em hospital público, as sessões de quimioterapia, as cirurgias e o uso da bolsa de colostomia, que fez parte de nossas vidas por quase um ano. Nesse tempo que a Beatriz usava a bolsa, o município fornecia apenas 10 por mês e com qualidade muito baixa. Via que ela ficava triste e não se sentia bem em usá-las. Então, para comemorar nosso aniversário de namoro, Dei de presente uma caixa de bolsa de colostomia da melhor qualidade. Ela chorou muito com o presente e isso ficou marcado no nosso relacionamento. Eu sonho com um mundo no qual os cuidadores e pacientes oncológicos não são vistos pela sociedade com um olhar de piedade. Eles devem ser enxergados como qualquer pessoa, com seus altos e baixos, seus momentos bons e momentos de dificuldade, como qualquer um. Thank you, Vinicius, for your story. We're going to keep sharing these stories as well as some of the stories we're already seeing coming through on our Twitter uh, before our break in about an hour, because now we're going to move to a session with an international panel of advocates and researchers who have developed the session promoting mental health and well-being among adolescent young carers, the Me We European Project. Um, and they're going to share more about this shared work uh, that they've done together with you. So as the next speakers come on camera with us, let me share a brief introduction to each of them. Please welcome Dr. Faylin Lewis. Dr. Lewis grew up as a youth caregiver for her disabled mother. Her experience led her to conduct research with young caregivers in the United States, United Kingdom, and Europe. Currently, Dr. Lewis is the manager of the Students for Health Equity program at Vanderbilt University's School of Nursing and an independent caregiving researcher and consultant. Next, let's welcome also Leonard Magnuson, an associate professor at the Department of Health and Caring Sciences at Linnaeus University, Sweden, and director of the Swedish Family Care Competence Center. He acted as the ethics, gender, and data manager within the EU MeWe project. Leonard has worked actively with co-creating evidence in the field of informal carers, care, and caring to inform policy. The most recent example being the inclusion of children as next of kin and young carers within the Swedish ratification of the European Child Guarantee. In his childhood and through adulthood, Leonard was a young carer for both his parents, an experience that continues to drive his commitment to improving the situation of carers. We'd like to welcome next Miriam Svensson. Miriam has a bachelor's degree in biomedicine and a master's degree in health and lifestyle from Halmstad University in Sweden. She was a research assistant within the MeWe project, working with the coordinating team at Linnaeus University. She is currently working as a facilitator at the Swedish Family Care Competence Center and will soon start her doctoral studies in health science at Linnaeus University. And her doctoral thesis will focus on young carers, drawing on the data within the MeWe project. And finally, allow me to introduce this session's co-moderators, Elizabeth Hansen and Saul Becker. Elizabeth Hansen is a professor at the Department of Health and Caring Sciences at Linnaeus University, Sweden, and is research director at the Swedish Family Care Competence Center, a center of excellence in the field of informal carers, care, and caring. 
She is principal investigator and coordinator of the European Union funded research and innovation young carers project NIWI. In her adolescence, she was a young carer and as an adult has cared for her parents and father in law. She is a board member and prior president of EuroCares, the European Association Working For and With Carers. Professor Saul Becker is the former provost of the University of Sussex and has held professorial posts at Cambridge, Sussex, Birmingham, Nottingham, and Loughborough universities in the UK. He has recently taken the position of Professor of Children and Families and Institute Director at Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK. He is regarded as a world leader for young carers research, policy, and practice, having worked in this field for 30 years. He has over 500 publications and keynote conference papers. In his childhood, he was a young carer, and as an adult, he cared for his mother. Today, he is an ambassador for the UK-wide major carers charity, Carers Trust, and a registered social worker. He is regarded by Universities UK, an umbrella organization for all UK universities, as one of the nation's lifesavers, a hundred individuals or groups based in universities whose work is making a life-changing difference. I want to thank you all for being with us to present on the MeWe project. Professor Hansen, I'd like to turn things over to you now, and I've we're about five minutes behind your time, so I just want to let you know that we'll give that five minutes back to you. Um, we do have the time, so um, please take that and I will go off camera over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Lauren, for your kind introduction and for those five minutes. Uh, it was a super present, a super introduction. Thank you very much uh, and to colleagues. Well, um, welcome everybody, wherever you are uh, across the globe. Delighted to be with you um, today for this important World Carers 2022 conversation. And we're going to be focusing on um, findings from our European project, focusing on adolescent young carers in Europe. And to be able to kick off our workshop today, I'd like to hand over to Professor Saul Becker, who will kindly be introducing the topic of young carers for us, that will then help set the scene for you to gain a better understanding of our, of our EU project. So over to you, Saul, and can we have the next slide, please? Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, and thank you, Lauren, for your introduction. And uh, again, thanks to everyone for inviting us to talk today. Um, I wanted to first just define young carers or young caregivers so that we're all talking about the same thing. We are literally here talking about children and young people under the age of 18. Um, so they have the legal status of being children, not adults. Um, and they are providing or intending to provide care assistance or support to another family member or a friend. The key thing here is that they are often carrying out regular caring roles for other people. Uh, and these will be significant or substantial caring tasks. And effectively what we're talking about here is that children are assuming a level of responsibility which would usually be associated with an adult. The key thing here is not to think that children are providing just very small amounts of care, um, childlike amounts of care, but they are doing the kinds of caring that previous speakers in this world conversation have been talking about. There's no real difference between what adults and what children have to do as carers. And the person receiving care is often a parent with an illness or disability, long-term mental health problem or whatever. And in most cases, there is comorbidity, a, con a, a combination of illnesses and other conditions. But children can be caring for grandparents or other relatives and friends. And indeed, a third of young carers are usually caring for more than one person. Next slide, please. When I started researching 30 years ago on young carers. There was nothing. We didn't really even have a phrase, young carers or young caregivers. Um, and over the last 30 years or so, there have been multiple books, articles, uh, conference papers um, that have been produced. Some which are generic, some which are surveys, some which are qualitative research, some which are, are involving significant uh, large data sets. And indeed today, if you go onto Google Scholar 
you will find over a quarter of a million items on young carers. Next slide, please. Over the last few years, we've been trying a number of us, researchers, practitioners, policymakers who work with young carers, to understand why there are different country responses to the phenomena of young carers, with some countries who are literally just waking up now, uh, we're calling those countries uh, awakening, and those other countries which are much more advanced. And you can see that the UK is a, a, at the level two, which is an advanced level, simply um, because it's been doing research for 30 years. It's got uh, significant uh, legal rights for young carers. Young carers in the UK have statutory uh, legal rights for support. It's got codes of guidance for social workers, healthcare workers. It's got national and local carers strategies specifically for young carers. And in between, you have all the other countries that have some engagement. And these are the countries that are engaged in 2016. The classification showed one uh, picture. And by 2021, it shows another picture with some countries moving forward. And policymakers and practitioners, the many of us who are now involved in doing work with young carers, are interested to know how do we move a country's response from the lower levels to a higher level? And those are the kinds of things and questions that we're concerned about in our work around policy and practice. Thank you. If I can hand back now um, to Elizabeth. Many thanks indeed, Saul, for having set the scene for us so well. Um, I'd like to ask for the next slide, please. And I'd like to give you an overview of our MeWe project. As you can see on this slide, the project focuses on psychosocial support for promoting the mental health and well-being of adolescent young carers in Europe aged 15 to 17 years. It was a 42-month project that began in January 2018 and finished at the end of June last year. Yeah. And the project received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme. And I'd like to highlight that the project consortium consisted of universities and research institutes working in partnership with civil society organisations. And we were all from six European countries, all with varying levels of awareness, policies, supports for young carers. Sweden, ourselves being the coordinator, together with the UK, the Netherlands, Italy, Slovenia and Switzerland, and also with Eurocare as Secretariat, the European NGO working to advance the situation of informal carers in Europe. Now, the first year of our project involved what we called systematizing the knowledge about adolescent young carers situation. This basically involved structuring up the available data, gathering it in, um, systematizing it, making it, uh, condensing it, and also collecting new data. Now, this included important cross-country uh, quantitative data from an online survey, which both um, Saul and Phelan led on from the UK, and which they'll now present some key findings from. So I'd like to hand back to firstly Saul, and then it would be Phelan, and to ask for the next slide, please. Thank you, Elizabeth. So this is the largest um, pan-European study of adolescent young carers ever conducted. Um, the online survey, which I'm just going to present some of the basic findings from, consisted originally of just over 9,000 uh, people a, uh, who uh, completed the survey. And the survey uses standardized instruments to measure children's well-being, as well as other specific questions around caregiving by children. Of those 9,000 participants, 7,000 were of the correct age. So we, we removed the people who weren't of the right age. And we then found that 2,099 were adolescent young carers aged 15 to 17, our primary group of which 70% were females. The interesting thing about these data is who receives care, what the health conditions are, 
and the outcomes of caring on children. And I'm briefly going to talk about each of those in turn. If we look at who receives care, you can see on this table that 69% of the children are caring for family members. And that ranges from mums, fathers, grandparents, and siblings. 16% were caring for more than one family member. And 53% of our sample were caring for a close friend. And 22% were caring for family and friends. It's very interesting when you see the cross-country differences, but in Italy, grandparents were the uh, largest group receiving care from children. 72% of the people who were receiving care in Italy were grandparents, and that compares to 13% in the United Kingdom. And this reflects something to do with the differences in state and other provision for older people. If I move on now to the health conditions of the people that were receiving care, you can see that physical disabilities accounted for 46%, mental illness 40%, cognitive impairments 26%, and addiction, alcohol, drugs, or other substances accounted for 10% of the family's health conditions. When you look at the friends that were receiving care, 69% of those friends receiving care had a mental illness and that was 82% of the friends in the United Kingdom compared with 30% in Italy. Next slide, please. What I want to just indicate now are some of the general findings that uh, from this online survey. What's important to know is that the amount of caring which is measured by a psychometric instrument called MACA, the multidimensional assessment of caring activities for children, the amount of caring does vary between countries. We found that female young carers, adolescent young carers do significantly more caring in some countries. We found positive and negative adaptation to caring by children. We found that young ad adolescent carers have a lower state of well-being measured by a, uh, an instrument called kids screen than non-carers. Females have the lowest. And critically, we find that the higher the levels of caring that a child gives in a family or with friends, then the more school difficulties, the more bullying, and the more they are likely to have their own mental health problems, a clear correlation. We also found that 29% of the children said that their own mental health had deteriorated. A significant proportion said that they had school performance difficulties, being bullied, and shockingly, 14% of the overall sample said that they had thought about hurting themselves or that they had thought about hurting others. This is the first pan-European survey that reveals the potential incidence of deliberate self-harm to oneself or potentially to someone else. Next slide, please. My final slide before I hand over uh, to Phelan indicates the kinds of the differences between countries relating to some of these negative impacts. So you can see here the negative effect on school performance, the experience of bullying, the physical health problems, mental health problems, those who are considered hurting themselves or others. And you can see across uh, this, the different country levels that are going with each of those. What's very interesting is that the United Kingdom, which is the red line, has the worst incidence on all of those measures. And this reflects um, the, a particular reason being that the sample for the United Kingdom were recruited from existing young carers projects. In the UK, we have a national network of young carers projects. And to get into those projects, you have to show your need. And many of those projects are working with the carers, young carers at the heaviest end. So these children were already in particular need and many were in particular distress. And this survey reveals that. But you can see 
how these uh, negative outcomes um, vary between countries. So it doesn't matter whether a country's level of uh, on our original classification that I showed you is advanced or at the lower end. All countries reveal young carers, adolescent young carers, who have significant mental health and other negative outcomes. Thank you. And now I'll hand to Failing. Next thank you, slide, Saul. please. Yes, next slide. Uh, thank you, Saul. Um, so we asked AYCs to tell us about the kinds of formal and informal support that they already have in place. 92% of the AYCs in our sample have an adult in the home receiving a wage and a much smaller percentage of families receive a government assistance. We also ask AYCs to name who is aware of their caring role. What's particularly interesting here is that of the AYCs who are employed, perhaps in part-time work, most reported that their employers were not aware of their caring role. This stands in contrast to the higher percentages of school and friend awareness, illustrating the settings that an AYC might either desire to or be forced to disclose their caring role, and also our recruitment strategy in schools and young care support organizations. By asking the open-ended qualitative question, what would support you as a carer? We learned that there were four emerging themes in response across our six sample countries. AOICs want more time for themselves and greater opportunities to have fun leisure activities. They also seek to speak directly with trained professionals such as therapists and social workers and youth workers. Perhaps reflecting their transitional stage to adulthood, AYCs reported that they want to talk to adults specifically to receive guidance about their life choices. AYCs want financial assistance, either money paid directly to them or given as aid to their care for person. Finally, AYCs expressed that they wanted educators to recognize their caring role and to be given flexibility with assignment deadlines, being sensitive to their balancing act of being a student and a carer. We also found that there were country specific themes, such as in the UK, AYCs want more formal support from services. And in Italy and Slovenia, AYCs feel that the state can play a greater role in providing formal support. Next slide, please. Now we'd like to hear your views and respect to your country context. We have three questions we'd like you to think about. You can view them on your screen there. If any particular question stands out to you and you wish to respond to any of these questions, then you're invited to write your answer in the chat. I'll read your answer out to the group and we'll work through your discussion in the chat. I'll take a moment so you can read through. Our first question, are there other country contacts, perhaps the global south, rural or farming locales, or this experience of adolescent carers might look different? Our second question, the presence of self-harming thoughts is most often alarming to professionals when we share our findings. How can we as researchers, advocates, and professionals create a safe space for young carers to speak out about the severe mental distress they may be experiencing? What is our role in lessening the stigma? And our last question, someone to talk to and help for the person they care for stood out as major findings when adolescent young carers were asked what would help them in their caring role. How has your country sought to address the needs of AYCs, if at all? What do you think your country could do more of? So I invite you to share your responses in the chat and I'll read through them. And you're welcome to respond to any of these questions and not necessarily in order.
Well, to get us maybe brainstorming here, um, I have a background in therapy. So I always think about question number two in terms of our findings on self-harm. Um, for me, it's particularly concerning. And I do wonder about um, what's our role as professionals and then also as an advocate, uh, what's our role in, in reducing stigma? For me, what I often think about is how can we uh, be real and authentic with the young carers that we do work with? So for me, I think about being real and realistic when you're talking about um, their caring experience and wanting to make sure that you don't trivialize or patronize them as young people. Ah, I'm seeing some answers come through. Okay, scroll up. Okay, so Lisa says, where I'm from Chicago, Illinois AYCs do a lot of caring for family members with addictions. They don't feel supported in keeping themselves clean and not repeating the patterns. Okay, yes, we also found, um, so not only with our sample of AYCs caring for chronic health conditions, but also addictions, that definitely came out. Okay, Jerry Lynn says, train teachers about the frequency of young caregiving and how to help identify children dealing with this to help connect them with services earlier in their caring experience to help prevent mental health issues. Yes, Jerry Lynn, I totally agree. Preventative care is exactly what we need. Okay, Andy also responding to question two, shows the need for ensuring that mental health well-being services have got good levels of young care awareness, contain information about young carers. We've been doing work with Cooth, an online mental health provider, delivering young care awareness, raising to their counselors. That's great. Um, also GPs, school nurses, and mental health practitioners. And Andy's pointed out that young carers will speak to their friends and not adults. Um, so young people need to know what support's available. That's great. Yeah, that definitely point, pinpoints, I think, the comfort level a young person might have in sharing with their peers. But I agree, definitely to make sure we're signposting to formal mental health services. Okay. Liv says, yes, she appreciates the care of in Brazil. Yes, the diversity of care. It's fantastic. Debbie says, it seems important that there is more and better prevention support for young carers and clear pathways to clinical support. GPs are pivotal, but don't always understand the need. That's right. I think if anything, in terms of what you take away from these findings, it's definitely the onus on us as professionals, educators, whatever is your sphere of influence um, that we have to identify and signpost young carers to services. Okay. Cindy Sam says, create a central hub of contact in every province for carers, giving them one-to-one -one coaching and making it easy to help navigate the healthcare ecosystem, getting them the help they need. Oh, yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah, Cindy, I think that's great. You know, what we find is young carers, um, you know, they not only do they want a trusted adult to talk to, but we need to make sure, as you said, that it is clear um, we are, I think, explicit in the support that we offer um, because you don't want, um, I, what I would say is that I think even for services that uh, are not necessarily dedicated young carers, it can still be beneficial to young carers, but we need to make sure we've made that clear and explicit for them. Okay, so Lisa saying, uh, I also work with AYCs whose families are homeless. Hmm. So a lot of responsibility is put on the children because the stress of homelessness shut down the parents. Okay, oh, more in the chat. Same here. Okay, Melinda, country context absolutely influenced the experience of young carers, access to services and supports, cultural influence and expectations, as well as belief systems. Fantastic, yes. All right, Connie Siskowski, we should include education in the curriculum of healthcare providers. And uh, yes, I'm seeing that my time is up. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, well, what a fantastic riveting discussion. Uh, so we are want to encourage you um, at the end of um, our presentation, we will have our Twitter handles and our email address listed. We welcome you to continue this discussion online and we want to hear your perspective. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Elizabeth, and next slide, please. Thanks very much, Phelan, and thanks to you, the audience, for being so active. I, I'm so sorry to cut you off there, guys, but we really want to continue the dialogue. So please do contact us after the session if we don't manage to get back to you with all your uh, questions and queries and your very valuable comments. Thanks so much. 
I'd like to introduce the next part of our workshop, which focuses on a presentation of our actual MIWI intervention that was informed by the survey results that you've just heard, together with other sort of knowledge sources, and it was co-designed directly together with young carers from all the six countries. So I'd like to now hand over to Miriam, who's going to share some of the details of our MIWI intervention with you. Over to you, Miriam. Thank you. Many thanks, Elizabeth. So, yeah, the main intervention is a psychosocial support primary prevention intervention, and it consists of MIWI groups uh, and the MIWI young players for by that. And as Elizabeth mentioned, the whole MIWI intervention, so both the groups and the mobile app have been co-designed and developed together with the young players and professionals working with them in all six part of countries. Uh, next slide, please. So if we start with the MIWI groups, uh, they are based on the DMAV model, uh, which has its roots in acceptance and commitment therapy and positive psychology. But see if you can hear me a better time for doing like this. Uh, okay. And uh, in the DMAV model, uh, D stands for the discoverer, N for the noticer, A the advisor, and the values. And uh, the discoverer, the noticer, and the advisor, uh, these are skills that we all have uh, and that we can use to go in the directions of our values, uh, namely what is important to us and what we mean for gives us energy and that we enjoy. And in more detail, the discoverer is our ability to explore and test the world through trial and error learning. So we use it to try new things and to see how they work, find and create new values, build strength, or uh, to find new ways to come into life. Uh, the noticer is our ability to be present, to pay attention and notice our inner experience and the physical signals coming from the external environment. Miriam, this is Lauren Rachel. I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the audience were having a bit of trouble hearing your audio and I want to make sure we can hear you clearly. I hear a bit of an echo, but I see that you have a microphone and I'm wondering if your audio selection might be on your computer mic and not that headset you have. Do you want to take a minute to, to take a look at that? Yeah, I just looked and it, uh, it should be uh, this uh, microphone. I'm so sorry. Um, but can you hear me all right now if I put it closer? I think closer is a little bit clearer. Thank you. Okay, I'll try this instead. Okay, so we're worried. We were at the noticer, and uh, so this is our ability to be uh, present, pay attention, and notice our inner experience and the physical signals coming from the external environment. And uh, using the noticer, it helps us pause and accept our feelings as they are, instead of automatically responding to, um, to them. So this helps us, for instance, to better handle difficult situations and notice what we feel good about. Then the advisor, metaphorically, it represents our inner voice, uh, which is used to make sense of the past, to form beliefs, to evaluate ourselves and others without the need of trial and error. So it does remind us of what we have learned before, so that we don't have to take unnecessary risks. So during the MIWI groups, uh, we learn how to best use these skills to strengthen our nursing and carers' resilience so that they can better handle difficult thoughts, to get in contact with and notice their own feelings, to grow and flourish, find meaningfulness and strength and energy, develop a flexible self-image and build strong social networks. And to do this, the MIWI groups consist of seven group sessions, uh, which are about two hours each, preferably one session per week, and a follow-up session after three months. 
and the MIWI groups can either be held online or face to face. Next slide, please. In the MIWI Young Carers mobile app, it aims to deliver support for young carers at a distance. Uh, it is used in the MIWI group, but it can also be, uh, be used as a separate support for young carers who are not participants in the groups. And it is available in Swedish, Italian, Dutch, Slovenian, German, French, and English, which are the languages spoken in the new partner countries. And the app, it is publicly accessible at no cost via Google Play and App Store in the EU, EEA, and EFTA states and the UK. Next slide, please. So if we just briefly looked at the content in the mobile app, we have the homepage, which um, includes news that is uh, related to young carers in one way or another. Then we have a, a left menu that includes the information pages uh, that has information about young carers' rights, about what help and support they can receive, what to do in emergencies, etc. We also have a launch pad menu. Uh, which is a navigation area where uh, a diary can be found, where they can um, write down their feelings and the thoughts and upload pictures. And then we have stories about other young carers and the educational resources used in the MIWI groups. And last but not least, we also have a chat where participants and facilitators in the MIWI groups can send messages to each other. So you can now go to the next slide and I will hand over to Elizabeth. Thank you. Many thanks, Miriam, for giving us an overview of our MIWI intervention. I'm now going to share with you just a short summary of some of our main evaluation findings from the testing of the MIWI intervention in our six partner countries. A clinical trial study was carried out in all the countries. In total, 110 adolescent young carers were in the intervention group and 107 in the control group, which was a waitlist control group, which meant those adolescent young carers were offered the intervention three months following the end of the intervention group. Both quantitative and qualitative data were collected, and I'm going to be focusing on presenting um, some of the feedback from the intervention group participants about the MIWI intervention. Overall, as you can see on this slide, that we can see that the MIWI intervention has the potential of contributing to adolescent young carers' increased well-being and boosting their resilience. Importantly, many of the young carers enjoyed the group activities. They expressed that it had taught them useful things such as dealing with stressful um, emotions and, uh, and feelings. They felt that the groups were worth going to, and they felt that the groups made them feel good about themselves. They had a, a better self-esteem and felt they were more kind to themselves. Half of the young carers also felt the person they were caring for was better off because they'd taken part in the groups. And we can also see that the intervention had a positive impact on young carers' school attendance and performance. Finally, as well, we got feedback from the young carers that they saw the MIWI app was a potentially useful asset to the groups because it provided another additional source of support for them. So that really, in a nutshell, uh, is a, an overview of our MIWI intervention. And if I can share with you the next slide, please. We'd love to hear from you what you're thinking when you've heard about our MIWI intervention. Is there anything you particularly like or, or dislike about it or unsure about? Are there things you think we can already improve? And also, we'd love to hear from you about how, if anything, you feel the intervention could be of potential benefit for adolescent young carers in your country, wherever you are across the globe today. So do please uh, send in your comments and feedback on the chat, please. We'd really love to hear from you.
we found that it was very positive that, um, in fact, during the COVID-19 pandemic, as part of the intervention was during the pandemic, that in actual fact, um, adolescent young carers really valued taking part in the groups. And these actually were carried out online during the pandemic when many young carers were feeling an increased sense of isolation. Um, so we, we found that was a very positive um, aspect um, of our, of our uh, project, actually. We hear now from Connie. In the past 15 years, we've worked with our two, oh, sorry, 2,000 caregiving youth and then families from grade six to high school graduation. I love the app idea as a supplement to our work. Many thanks, Connie. Um, we felt that this, this is where young carers are. That's what they were saying to us during the project. So we, we also feel that, it, that it's a valuable part of our intervention. Monica's asking, Monica Gross is asking, are there systems in place that you can connect young carers with social services if they're in danger for physical or sexual abuse in their home relationship? I wonder, Failing, would you be prepared to, to answer that for me for, for Monica? Um, sure, um, that's a great question, Monica. Um, you know, I think historically in the young carer space, there's always been this tension between the involvement of social services um, and that we don't want uh, young caring or the presence of disability or illness in the home to be seen as an issue of neglect or abuse. So there is kind of that um, tension there. Um, but certainly if there is, if you do suspect that a child, any child, whether they're a young carer or not, are in danger of either being physically abused or sexually abused, certainly do um, report that um, to the appropriate authorities. Um, and if you are a professional like myself, you may even have a mandatory reporting duty um, to your state or, or local authority. Many thanks, Phelan, and we, we invite you to still keep your comments coming. I, because of the time factor, I'm going to move on to the next part of our session, but please do keep your questions and comments coming. I'd like to now ask for the next slide, please. I'm going to turn to the final part of our session, where we'll update you on our current implementation work post-project with MIWI, uh, sharing with you developments in Sweden as an example. Well, our Swedish Family Care Competence Centre that's linked to our university is currently offering, thanks to a grant from the National Board of Health and Welfare in Sweden, we're offering a, a range of education and training programmes for interested NGOs and municipalities who wish or are interested to start MIWI groups with young carers. We're also coordinating online network meetings so that the facilitators can get together from the different municipalities and organisations from across the breadth and depth of Sweden with the aim of, of sharing experiences and learning from each other. We currently have about 10 municipalities together with the Red Cross and the Swedish Church that are involved and more are lined up in the autumn. And we're also offering a range of systematic follow-up and evaluation tools as well. Next slide, please. So we're going to be asking you the key question of, are you interested in the MIWI intervention and how can we at our centre, together of course with other partners, how can we help you if as appropriate? Well, what we can do is we can offer you some educational materials in English, we can guide you to an online training course in the DNAV model, which is the theoretical approach guiding our intervention. And we can also invite you to opportunities to take part in online learning networks uh, in, with our Swedish municipalities and NGOs that are working directly with MIWI groups. So having given you a flavour of our current implementation work, I'm going to hand back over to Phelan again, who's going to spend the next few minutes discussing with you how she thinks the MIWI intervention can be transferred to other countries, giving the US as an example. So next slide, please, and over to you, Phelan. Thank you, Elizabeth. So after such great success with the MIRI intervention in our six European countries, we anticipate that the intervention has much usefulness in other countries around the world. However, if you come from a country where there is little to no awareness of young carers like I do coming from the United States, you may wonder how the MIWI intervention can be replicated in your home country. Um, but don't worry, we've put together some tips to help you jumpstart your brainstorming. 
So where might you host the MeWe intervention or MeWe program? You could host the MeWe weekly sessions in secondary school settings. Um, we think middle school and high school are the best ages for reading and understanding comprehension. You could also host it within a youth organization. In the US, that may mean groups like the Boys and Girls Club or YMCA after school programs. So who, who would you want to lead the MeWe intervention? You will want to select group facilitators who have experience in group youth work, such as youth workers, group counselors, and social workers. But they don't necessarily have to have familiarity with the DNAV model. Our MeWe manual can teach them that. And again, the how. So if you do come from a country where you don't have a ready pool of young carers waiting and available, you'll want to identify them first, then encourage them to participate in the intervention. You can identify young carers in your school or organization through the MeWe survey screening questions, asking if there is a presence of illness or disability in the family and if they support that ill or disabled person. You might also want to incorporate the MACA, Saul mentioned earlier today, and find out the amounts of caregiving that a young person is undertaking. So, how could the MeWe intervention work in your respective country or organization? Put your ideas in the chat and I'll read them out loud. Okay, Monica, I see that you've asked, are there aspects to the MeWe groups that engage young carers who participated in the program to become peer-to-peer -peer supporters or once they are older to become mentors and so forth? That's a fantastic uh, question, Monica. Um, actually, I could say from being involved with the UK clinical trial, um, that actually, yes, that was some of the feedback and recommendations that we received, that um, the program was so beneficial to them, particularly giving them that supportive element during the pandemic, that they felt that they wanted to be able to replicate that as uh, I would say as an older um, young adult carer. So perhaps maybe being able to uh, be a leader uh, amongst their peers. So yes, great question. And I think that's something that in the future should definitely be added. I'm also thinking here, um, so I've spoken about the US in which there's a context where there is much lower um, young care awareness um, across research policy and practice. Um, I'm also thinking about our another MeWe country, Slovenia. Um, as I think Elizabeth mentioned earlier, they also had the MeWe intervention in summer camps there. And that was a way where that actually was not a summer camp that was dedicated uh, to young care specifically. It was a general youth camp. And by using um, some screening questions and, and then already having in place facilitators, the camp counselors who were familiar with group work, familiar with um, you know, unconditional positive regard, reflective listening skills, all of those elements and characteristics that you would need to be able to do successful group work, that was already there for summer camp. So they were able to uh, facilitate our MeWe program with that group of uh, children there, of course, by screening to find young carers, but then already having the uh, the leaders there in place. Okay, I see you. Oh, comments are trickling in now. Okay, can we use the MACA as part of an AYC health check? Uh, I think my answer to say yes, um, but we do have the author and expert on the MACA here, uh, Professor Saul Becker. Do you want to speak to that quickly for us? So uh, I hope you can hear me again. Uh, absolutely. The MACA is designed to measure the amount of caregiving responsibilities a child has and the different kinds of caregiving they have. But there's another sister um, psychometric instrument called the PANOC, the positive and negative outcomes of caring, which uh, identifies both the positive and negative uh, adaptation to caring that children will have. So both of these psychometric instruments are now being used in about 15 to 20 countries. They were used across all of our MeWe project. And there is a manual which explains how you use them, how you score them, etc., which is available. Um, if you contact us, we can provide you with that. Thank you, Saul. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Our next comment, our agency has support services for the young carer. It is great to hear how, great to hear this Miwi intervention. We hope it can be tried in Hong Kong. That's wonderful. Yes, we'd love to see this replicated all over the world. And we're happy to chat about how, um, offline, um, how maybe we can best support you um, with the training materials that we do have. Okay, um, Connie has a question to everyone. Um, are other countries looking at military caregiving children? Fantastic question. I think that brings us up to speed. Okay. Many thanks indeed, Phelan, uh, for that. And also to you, the audience, for your fabulous feedback and questions. Thank you so much. Do keep them coming. Uh, and as Phelan <coughs> and Saul have said, we are available um, after the uh, end of the World Carers Con Conference uh, conversation event as well. So I'm going to now um, ask Saul to kindly sum up the key highlights um, from our session. So I'll hand over to you again, Saul. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm doing this in real time, um, literally trying to make some final points um, about what we've heard and ways forward. In particular, we showed you this classification which showed countries at different levels of awareness. So what I'm going to try and do is capture some of the ways that a country might move up that kind of um, scale um, and be more engaged and more responsive to the nature and incidents and needs of young carers. So here are a few points by way of summary um, for, um, for our audience. Firstly, I think we have to all recognize that um, young carers are a personal issue for families, uh, for children. They're a social issue in that they require a social response a political issue, because unless we can get politicians and governments at national or local levels engaged, it's very difficult to move things forward. And it's a professional issue because young carers require interventions and responses from social workers, teachers, um, healthcare workers, doctors, and so on. Young carers effectively are everyone's business. Um, and I think in any way forward, we need to privilege the voices of young carers themselves nothing for us without us. And that's been a guiding um, principle for the MeWe project for the last three years. Everything needs to be determined in co-production with young carers. So here are some suggestions for ways forward, how you can move yourself up that classification. Firstly, you do need to have a solid base of research to provide evidence about the needs of young carers, the numbers of young carers, the outcomes of caring on children, because that's what many policymakers, practitioners, uh, et cetera, uh, require. But we also need to raise public awareness because without public awareness and support for doing anything about young carers, it's going to be a difficult battle. And to raise public awareness, you must utilize the media as an ally. They can absolutely elevate and accelerate the issue of young carers onto the public consciousness as well as the professional and policymakers consciousness. And the final point I'd want to make there is learn from other countries. Don't reinvent the wheel. There's lots of evidence from the MeWe project and many other projects which will help you think through what you need to do. We, of course, also need government engagement. We need more services for young carers, and these are traditionally across the world now provided as respite projects in which young carers get a break, but they get activities and other interventions. We obviously, from this workshop, need greater professional awareness and training across the board, social workers, teachers, healthcare workers, because it's very clear that education providers, health and social services have a key role to play. And we need much greater identification of young carers in all of those settings and assessments of their needs. And finally, I would say that analysis is important, but action is critical. Our task, everyone in this room, is to move young carers from a position of vulnerability vulnerability to excessive caregiving, to the negative outcomes that we have described in the MeWe project, to a position of growth, to enjoy childhood, to take an active role in childhood, to make mistakes, to get the best out of their education, and to be prepared to be productive adults. Early interventions and the interventions that we've discussed today can make a real difference to the lives of young carers. And if we intervene early, 
before they become adolescent young carers, earlier, when they're five, six and seven, we can prevent some of these children becoming carers in adolescence or later life. Finally, I would say to you that services and interventions should be seen as an investment in children's futures, not a cost. So let's make important things happen and let's do it together. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks so much, Saul, for your fabulous summing up. Um, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Also like to say a very quick thank you to Betsy Olson, who was our International Advisor and Ethics Board member. And she was very active throughout the project. A big thank you to you and all fellow members. And she's just kindly done a post for our website. So thanks so much for that. And I'd like to say thank you to you all. And I'm going to hand over to Lauren to kindly close our session. Thanks, Lauren. I want to give my thanks to each one of you for a fantastic, just a brilliant session. Um, and thank you for answering so many questions um, and, and sharing some of the considerations that our audience um, had for how they can take some of what they learned from you today kind of back to their own programs and community. So thank you and thanks for being with us. Um, our panelists for this session have shared their contact information in the chat box. So if you haven't looked at that and you're know that you want to follow up. Um, they do have a website for this project um, and they've shared some of their personal contact details. So please grab that out of the chat box um, and be in touch with them and continue this conversation. Thank you all. We're going to transition now a little outside of our agenda. If you're following along in our agenda, we have a story to hear next from Jean. We're not going to um, miss out on hearing from Jean, we're going to hear that story from Jean before our break in an hour. Because right now at this time, we um, are going to transition to our next session. We have a live panel coming up. Um, so in this last hour, exploring this mental health and caregiving okay. theme, we're going to hear from an international panel of carers and care advocates who are stepping up in their organizations and their communities to embrace sibling carers. Caring for a sibling with a serious health condition, disability, or other care need is a special role and one that may not necessarily be well represented when we first think about caregiving and carers relationship to the person receiving care. I'm pleased to now welcome Liv Mendelson, the Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence in Canada. Liv is going to introduce the panelists she's brought with her today, some joining us at very early and very late hours of the night and morning. So thank you all for being here with us live and thanks for sharing time with us. I'll turn things now over to Liv Mendelson of the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence in Canada. Thanks so much, Lauren, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be with everyone uh, today. And thank you to our panelists who are indeed joining us uh, late uh, at night or early in the morning uh, from around the world. Um, I'm pleased to be with you today uh, from the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence. We are a new initiative powered by the Azraeli Foundation, um, supporting uh, caregivers programmatically, uh, but also uh, policy and research um, around caregiving. Um, and I am going to, um, in a few moments, uh, bring forward um, our wonderful panel, and they will be introducing themselves. Uh, Katie Arnold from Siblings Leadership Network US, Claire Kassa from Sibs UK, Piyush Mishara from Siblings Support India, Helen Reese from Siblings Canada. Siblings Canada is a part of the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence. Uh, Ify Philippa Peterkins Ito from Siblings of Special Needs Nigeria, and Kate Strom uh, from Siblings Australia. Uh, but before we go ahead and do that, um, we are going to hear some recorded comments from Dr. Ariella Meltzer, um, who is a research fellow at the Centre for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, whose research really uh, will ground the conversation uh, and uh, has really been at the heart of some of the international uh, knowledge exchange and collaboration. I think you'll find um, that this work around the needs of siblings um, who, um, as we heard already, are uh, sometimes unidentified and, and very often um, don't receive adequate or appropriate support, um, that the work to support those siblings um, as Saul Becker said uh, on the previous panel, is, um, is really infused with the philosophy of nothing about us without us. Um, and that 
um, the uh, supports designed for siblings uh, are, are designed uh, by siblings, um, and we're going to see that. Um, I am actually, there are a number of slides, I'm going to just let the staff know, uh, we don't need to go ahead uh, with the slides, I think let's Let's move directly to the comments of Dr. Ariella Ariel Meltzer, uh, because we do want to leave time uh, for questions with our amazing panel, um, who you are starting to see turn on their videos. Um, so if we can go um, right ahead to the video of Ariella Meltzer, that would be very helpful. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Sorry, I'm only present by pre-record. Juggling a young baby and international online conference time zones is definitely a challenge. My name is Ariella Meltzer. I'm based in Sydney, Australia, and I work at the Centre for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales. I'm a social policy researcher with a particular interest in sibling disability research. In my most recent sibling disability work, I've conducted a study of sibling support provider organisations in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the UK and USA. This study created a model or typology to describe the sibling support they provide, as well as detailed the operational conditions that sibling support providers work within. It was the first research of its kind into sibling support as a field of practice. I've been asked to say a little about it today to set the scene for the panel. So a few key points from my research. The first is that across the countries in the research, sibling support typically addresses all or some of five key areas. One, siblings' individual needs. So things like rec recognition and validation of personal experiences social emotional well-being and the knowledge and skills they need to navigate the disability service system. Uh, second is relationships with their brother or sister with the disability and their parents. The third is connection and community building between siblings as an identity group. The fourth is advocacy for siblings as an identity group and the final one is research into sibling support to develop and keep up with best practice. Um, another key point from my research is that sibling support is delivered by different kinds of providers. Many are what I've called sibling only providers, which means that they, they are organizations that are dedicated only to siblings of people with disabilities. These are the types of providers that you have on the panel today. Some other providers service siblings among other groups though, for example, together with people with disabilities themselves or parents or other types of carers. Particularly among the sibling only providers, sibling support organizations are almost always very small. And so many rely on the passion and volunteer hours of siblings of people with disabilities themselves to run them. These providers frequently struggle to gain recognition and to gain externally provided resources and funding for their work. This is especially the case where they are part of much bigger service systems around disability, caregiving or families that don't always recognise the role that siblings play or why sibling support might even be required. This can be a really hard situation for staff and volunteers, both in terms of the impact they want to have and the resources and conditions that they're working within. Yet, nevertheless, sibling support organisations are so resilient and persistent. They have provided incredible amounts of support to thousands of siblings across the globe, and they're continually broaching new and innovative areas. Notably, this currently includes turning their attention to increasing the diversity of cultural and other forms of representation within sibling support as a field of practice and as a field of support that people receive. Um, and also another new area is thinking through new funding and resource models um, that fit the changing international context for service provision around individualization of funding, for example and the changing economic climate that has um, resulted from the COVID-19 crisis and other international trends over the past several years. These insights, I hope, set the scene a little bit for what you might hear from the panelists today. Uh, some of the panelists represent countries outside those in my study, 
but many of the issues are nevertheless the same or similar. I'm excited to, make, to expand my work soon, hopefully later this year, to include a wider range of countries and national locations. But for now, I'll hand over to the providers on the panel today and let you hear firsthand from their experiences. Thank you so much. And uh, a big thank you to Ariella, whose work in many ways uh, kickstarted this, this um, nascent international network. Um, and we're so pleased to have so many of you with us today. Um, we are going to, we do have a larger panel, so we're going to address questions um, to individuals um, sort of in small groupings. Um, and the first question is a very straightforward one, um, which is simply, what are the main areas your sibling support organization focuses on? So if you can introduce yourself um, and, and share that with us, um, let's start with uh, Piyush from India. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone, I'm Piyush, uh, and I'm the co-founder of Sarthi, which is Sibling Support Network India. And our main focus has been first the visibility of the word sibling in India, like people uh, don't even recognize that word. And I think over the past year, we have at least achieved that goal, if not the other goals, the visibility of siblings. And uh, we are a very small group, small community of about 100 siblings uh, across India, but majorly from the uh, big cities. And our major focus has been on the adult sibling issues like uh, future planning or mental health support or topics such as marriage uh, or how to manage as a sibling uh, when something occurs in the family, like death of a family member. So we have focused on this. Thank you. Thank you, Piyush. I think the issue of people identifying as sibling caregivers is one that's going to come up um, again and again. Um, uh, Helen, can we have you share uh, your work with us? Thanks, Liv. Yeah, my name is Helen Reese, and I'm a co-founder along with Becky Rossi of Siblings Canada which has recently become part of the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence. Um, our work at Siblings Canada has really focused in three areas. We have focused on connecting siblings with each other because we learn best from the stories of others, particularly over the pandemic period. Um, we held a lot of virtual meetups and webinars and different ways that siblings could connect mentoring programs. We also are focused on the mental health of siblings, um, staying strong and resilient so that we can continue to provide care over our lifetime, the lifetime of our siblings. And then finally, we're doing a lot of work around online learning. So we are putting out a, very shortly we'll be putting out a learning curriculum on uh, how as a sibling you can ensure the long-term financial security of your brothers and sisters with disabilities. So those are the three areas that we uh, are working on, although there are certainly way more areas that we'd like to work on. There's just, uh, as Ariella said, a small, we started small and, uh, and with limited resources, but hopefully that'll change one day. <laughs> Thank you. Claire Casa from SIDS UK. Same Hello question there. for you. Thank you. Uh, really lovely to be here. Um, SIDS in the UK was set up 21 years ago. And, and unlike many others have described, we're also a small organisation. We're fortunate enough to have uh, three full-time equivalent staff working across the lifespan of siblings. So we work with both young siblings and adult siblings. Um, for our young siblings, that mainly is through our online uh, Young Sibs Information Service. Uh, for adult siblings, we again um, provide support and information, a lot of that through peer groups um, that are led by um, volunteer siblings who do an amazing job for us. Uh, and some of those have developed into issue-based groups. So they've really, we've seen a really big interest in um, siblings wanting to connect, particularly over the last couple of years. Uh, and those groups have, have really uh, become much more established um, and we're thrilled about that. Uh, and like Helen's described, one of the, the biggest aims of our organisation is, is to connect siblings, is to bring them together so that they can um, gain information, support, build their resilience um, and learn together. Um, and we've done this through 
an array, array of different types of workshops, mostly online, uh, but, but providing art, well-being activities, um, providing information around access to, to services, which has been absolutely key. And, and then finally, the other big area of our work is in educating parents and professionals about the needs of, of particularly young siblings. Uh, and we do that through training and online workshops. Um, and we also uh, run several times a year training for professionals on, on running direct sibling support groups. Um, and, 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 and more broadly, also trying to influence stakeholders, obviously really important to try and, uh, and change the landscape um, for, for siblings in the policy arena. Thank you. Uh, Kate Strom from Siblings Australia. Kate, you're muted. Now, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes, well, it's interesting because Siblings Australia has been going for 23 years. I founded it um, back in 1999 and actually met the founder of the SIBS UK organisation many years ago. So we've been following a fairly similar path and we support siblings um, across the age range. And um, actually, like Claire said, we're a very small organisation and, and have had ups and downs in terms of what resources we've had. But we certainly um, believe that um, preventative whole family approaches are really important. And so we try and work with families and providers as early as possible. We raise awareness. We do a lot of advocacy uh, in, at both government and community level, raise awareness with providers and with families. With children, we focus mainly on training for um, the people that are in their lives, um, whether that be educators, parents, um, disability providers. Um, and we do some work with younger siblings that I'll talk about later. But we believe if we support siblings early, then that relationship will be strengthened between them and the person with disability. And so it adds so much to the life of the person with disability um, over a lifetime. And then as siblings age, we provide more direct services. We provide online support for siblings to connect together. Um, that's been going for many years and so many siblings need support, not only to connect with others and understand the emotional impacts, but also support to understand what services are out there for both themselves and their brother or sister. We have a lot of information on our website and then um, we've developed some online training and a range of other um, resources and services. Um, we also have carried out some research ourselves and contributed to other research. Thank you. And Katie Arnold from Siblings Leadership Network uh, in the US. Hi, thank you. Um, it's great to be with you all today. I'm Katie Arnold. I'm the Executive Director of the Sibling Leadership Network. And I'm based in Chicago, Illinois in the USA. I'm the second oldest of five kids. I have four siblings, um, including my sibling with disabilities. And so my sibling experience has really shaped my worldview and influenced my career path. So the Sibling Leadership Network, or SLN for short, is a national nonprofit in the US created by and for SIBs. We were founded in 2007, um, and our mission is to provide siblings of individuals with disabilities the information, support, and tools to advocate with their brothers and sisters and promote the issues important to them and their entire families. We are welcoming to siblings of people with any type of disability, uh, that we tend to draw the most members of siblings of intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our network now has over 6,000 people across the country and chapters in 27 different states. And our vision is eventually every state in the US will have a sibling chapter because the chapters are really the grassroots of the organization where the, that more personal contact happens. Um, and each of our chapters has its own feel and flavor. And the SLN has three main areas of focus, or we sometimes refer to them as the three legs on the stool that kind of hold the SLN up. 
First is research, getting more and better research on the sibling experience. Second is policy and advocacy, really working to get the sibling voice at the policy table and engaging siblings in advocacy. And third, support and information, providing peer support and sharing information with siblings and their families across the lifespan. Uh, we have a lot of virtual events and meetups. Um, we have an online support group called SibNet that's hosted by the Sibling Support Project and the Sibling Leadership Network co-hosts that. Um, and we've also seen the needs of si siblings and their families drastically increase during the pandemic and really have been working to address those needs. Thank you. I think we, we definitely hear some common themes about peer-to-peer -peer support, mental health support, planning around financial and practical needs and, and increasingly research policy and advocacy. Uh, and we will be talking more about all of those things. Um, given the context of COVID and given the um, increasing focus, although as Ariella said, uh, said still, uh, we still have a ways to go, but the increasing focus on sibling caregivers, um, what, uh, what is your organization planning to focus on next? Um, uh, and I will, um, I will start where we stopped uh, with Katie Arnold. Sure. Uh, so where are we focused on next? Um, the Sibling Leadership Network, uh, we're working to build an inclusive sibling community, and we're focused on increasing the diversity within our network, especially creating a safe space where siblings who are Black, Indigenous, and other people of color and siblings from other traditionally marginalized and unrepresented communities can really join together to share stories, to learn about resources, and receive information and validation and support. We partnered with the Sibling Support Project and Special Needs Siblings to hold BIPOC sibling roundtables since November of 2020. Um, and we also created uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that is just starting to think about creating a workshop series on cultural humility. Also through a grant from the Community Care Corps, um, we have ex some exciting new programs. We have a SIB to SIB mentoring program that matches adult siblings of people with disabilities with each other for peer support. And we'd like to expand this SIB to SIB program to reach even more siblings. We also want to continue to grow our monthly podcast series, which is new for us. Um, there's topics related to siblings, to parents, and to people with disabilities. Some of those topics have included how siblings juggle care, their multiple caregiving roles, like often caring for their aging parents, their own children, and also their brother or sister with a disability. Um, another topic we had was long distance sibling caregiving. When you live out of state, um, you know, from your sibling and have that long distance caregiving as a sibling. We have many more topics that we would like to tackle, especially to help families plan for the future as parents age and care often transitions to siblings. And uh, finally, we, um, we hold a national SLN conference every other year. And last year we had an international panel that brought together all of the people on this panel today. And it was an amazing experience um, to really learn from each other around the world. And so next, I would love for us to hold an international sibling summit to continue the connection, support, and learning among our respective sibling organizations in various countries. Thank you. Katie, I think you'll find there's great appetite for that. Um, and we really look forward to supporting that, that initiative. Um, Claire, Casa, same question to you. Where Where is your organization going, both in the context of COVID um, and beyond? And maybe you can also speak to some of the issues groups that you um, alluded to earlier. Um, there's some, some questions about that. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, obviously the pandemic's had an enormous impact on siblings. And we, we have also done some research around the impact, particularly around uh, young siblings. Um, over the next couple of years, uh, we want to expand our work around schools uh, for young siblings. We have a, a SIBS Talk programme, which is an intervention for primary age uh, school children. And we want to look at expanding that and working with ever more schools um, and then particularly with some of the young care organisations who are looking at some school census work. 
Um, there's also some uh, a piece of work around respite and short breaks um, that the government are undertaking here. And we're really hoping um, that there'll be an increased emphasis on the impact of those short breaks on, on young siblings. Um, in terms of the issue based groups uh, that we run for adult siblings, yes, they've really developed over this last um, year, particularly. So we run a program uh, of uh, groups for bereaved siblings, for example. Uh, we've also been running uh, a group for um, siblings who have lost parents. Um, so we're calling it the O group, uh, the orphaned group, but actually it's really important for, for siblings who have that experience to be able to come together. We've recently established a men's group, so a group for brothers. Um, and we're also uh, just starting a group for, for siblings who have two or more disabled brother or si brothers or sisters. Um, there's, and that's been in a really strong response to siblings who want to come together to share experience Experiences with other siblings who have similar experiences. So some of the, the really broad groups have been really powerful, uh, but we've been noticing that there's been a, a real call for those very specific um, groups and uh, yeah, really important work. Really exciting. Uh, Kate Strom, Australia. Yes, well, um, the next thing that we're planning and we're very excited about is launching our new train the trainer program for people to become registered SIBWORKS providers. SIBWORKS is our peer support program that um, has been evaluated and, and we've done a major re revamp of that. We also want to develop guidelines for organisations and practitioners in terms of best practice sibling support. But our biggest focus this year will be again on developing more resources and services for teen sibs and adult siblings. And again, the, the latter activity um, in terms of adult and teen siblings will be around connecting with other siblings, sharing experiences, those sorts of things, but also accessing information again to support their brother or sister with disability and then as Katie said, balance those responsibilities then with their other responsibilities around work and family. And we hear from a lot of siblings who are really struggling to work out how to manage those different responsibility responsibilities. And much of the problem of that is really the communication within families and planning for the future. And that's often difficult um, topics to cover and to communicate about. So we want to really assist parents and siblings to communicate more easily about some of those issues and to find ways forward um, in benefiting the whole family. And we are hoping to develop an online guidebook for siblings um, here and also run various webinars and Facebook Lives to ensure that siblings have access to that information and can share that information. We also want to look at doing some more research into the benefits of a sibling relationship to a person with disability, because I think there's not enough awareness. Often we look at the caregiving roles in a practical sense, and they're often very important. But even if a sibling isn't provide any, providing any caregiving, the relationship that they have with the person with disability is so important over a lifetime in terms of well-being, social inclusion, safety, all of those things. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Piyush, uh, your organization is really at a point of growth. Um, where, where are you headed? And um, tell us a bit about the future for Sibling Support Network India. Yes. So after COVID, we have had a huge setback. Like we couldn't really uh, come together because uh, after the second wave of uh, COVID, and uh, as Ariella also told that sibling organizations are driven by passionate siblings or volunteers. So we are also a model like that. So right now, it's, right now, very frankly, it's kind of the question of existence. Like, how do we like uh, ex make the organization exist? Uh, that is the first challenge we are facing right now. And uh, moving forward, uh, I think we want to, uh, we are kind of reformatting how we work. And we want to move uh, a little bit before the intervention, whatever we are doing, like the future planning or the other things for adult siblings to know what exactly is going inside the minds of siblings or 
we want to get out there and talk to them first uh, without even talking about all these things like okay you are a caregiver or like you have these things to do so our aim is to reach out to more siblings in tier 2 and tier 3 cities which we haven't done till now and uh, uh, and kind of uh, uh, exploring what is going uh, how to basically open them up uh, how do we open them up or make them be- better communicators and uh, uh, to to in talking about the intervention thing we are very keen on focusing now on uh, what to do regarding school siblings school going siblings and something also we are focusing uh, we call it as sip runners it is still in ideation stage but we have a pair of siblings who are doing entrepreneurship work in india like some of them have their own cafes some of them are, are running their art organizations so we just want to like uh, make a platform on how to expand this for the other siblings uh, so yeah this is what we are planning for thanks terrific thank you and helen siblings canada Yes, so um we have so many ideas that it's hard to know where to start, but looking at the immediate future, we also did some research um over the COVID period on um the experience of siblings during COVID and found that many siblings were providing care and they were also experiencing some very um, difficult emotions around sadness, um guilt, fear and worry. So one of the things that we worked on and will continue to work on is providing mental health support with our partners at the uh, Center for Addiction and Mental Health and we have an ACT program acceptance and commitment therapy training that we are offering um specifically to siblings. So we'll be doing that through uh 2022 and 2023. Um we're going to be working uh very hard at trying to um i think it was Kate said that um you were doing this too working with service providers um disability service providers to help not only raise awareness of the importance of the role of siblings but also um to try and engage them to provide support uh we found that when people really needed help um if they were connected to a disability organization that that organization might be best positioned to help the the sibling and their their brother or sister with a disability at that time so those are the immediate things that they that we're working on um we're going to be doing Um, well there's an appetite to look at young carers and what they need a young sibling so that's sort of like a something that we're looking at um we're also um hoping to look at some uh, continue our research so we're uh looking for new research partners and um different topics uh we're perhaps around um how tied to policy like how siblings can be compensated in different ways if that's possible even and what kind of um policy changes might be needed to better support uh, sibling carers who are often um you know in their peak income earning periods when they need to uh you know pivot and provide care um so that's an area of interest um and of course we want to build our library of learning opportunities so we have a significant uh course coming out in the fall and then we would like to build on that library over time um so that there's uh you know specific topics that are of interest um to siblings that have come up through the research that we've done and then yeah i think um we're also interested in bringing siblings together in different ways through symposiums and conferences and webinars so we have a lot of um plans and dreams and um hope we can make them come true <laughs> so before we get into i think you've heard from several folks about um sustainability of their organization um this this phenomenon of sibling led which is really important but also places a a significant strain on um the siblings doing this work uh we are going to get into that and we're going to get into um how um this sibling work fits into the larger work of caregiving organizations uh i just want to take a step back and helen we're going to start with you and just uh, share with us a little bit about from your perspective um what the unique needs are um of siblings um within the the kind of 
uh, landscape of, of supports for caregivers. I think um, one of the unique needs is really the longevity of the support that's needed. So this is a lifelong journey and it doesn't just start when you're 18 or stop when you're 18. And, um, and so I think it, there's a real need to look at the continuity and a life course and what's needed when and where. Many adult siblings don't even identify themselves as caregivers because it's just who we've been our whole lives. And only when there's maybe a crisis might we say, hmm, I think perhaps we belong to um, this particular group of people who are in the same situation as us. So really focusing on how to provide care over the life course. And um, perhaps it's front of mind uh, because of the work that we're doing in the course creation, but really financial security. How can you um, provide care and provide care for such a potentially a very long time and not um, struggle yourself financially? And then, uh, of course, the issue of disability and poverty, which it seems in all countries seems to go hand in hand. So um, those are uh, the two unique pieces. I mean, of course, there are many. Um, and uh, but those are the two pieces that really stand out for me right now. Thank you, Helen. Piyush, same question to you. I, I see you nodding. And I know that your organization has um, really focused around having people um, even identify um, as sibling uh, caregivers. That's something that you've, uh, you've spoken about. So um, same same question to you about sort of this unique um, need set of sibling caregivers. Uh, uh, sorry, can you please repeat the question? So what, yeah, what, um, what do you find uh, are unique to the needs of sibling caregivers um, within the larger landscape of, of all caregivers? I think, uh, I think in India, uh, whatever the uh, disability organizations are there or whatever we have been working on, uh, it's too much towards the parentification of siblings. Like uh, when, when we talk about sibling support, they uh, directly need the resources or what to do regarding their disabled siblings and not necessarily, they don't think about themselves. And we have, uh, we are having a very, we have to have a very difficult time in making them realize that no, like you also have a life or like you also uh, have your own things going on. So that is a main uh, identity thing uh, which we have come across. So for that, we really have to like uh, 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 do sessions or like connect with the uh, siblings who are experienced. And it takes us a lot of time to like uh, make the siblings realize that they also uh, 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 can do like whatever they want to do and not just be totally focused on what uh, their disabled siblings uh, want or their parents want. So this is one spectrum. And the other spectrum is the kind of siblings uh, many parents ask us. Uh, our uh, uh, typical sibling is not not at all bothered about the disabled sibling or bothered about us. So what what can we do? So it's like a very extreme ends we have um, in India. That is what we have seen till now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, over to you, Claire. Yeah, I, I echo what's been said so far in terms of self-identification is a huge issue uh, for siblings in the UK. Um, so often siblings don't know that being a sibling is a thing. Uh, they don't identify with the word. Um, they see themselves as a brother or a sister, not as a carer. Um, and I think there's a whole issue there about siblings need support regardless of whether they provide care or not. There's an impact on their life and their outcomes uh, and their well-being and mental health. So it's really important that we don't just focus on the caring element of being a sibling. And it is that lifelong aspect um, that, you know, young siblings are thinking about who's gonna look after a brother or sister in the future, what's gonna happen. Um, those worries are happening with children of six, seven, eight, nine years old. Um, so it's how we support siblings across that lifespan as, as small organizations um, with a huge job ahead of us. Um, I think also that something that we've seen 
uh, significantly is that siblings aren't always taken seriously. Uh, their views aren't always seen as important, that actually um, parents' views are taken in greater priority over siblings' views. And so there's been some of that tension really in terms of siblings not being at the table for some of those policy discussions, for some of the personal discussions. Um, and actually siblings have a huge amount of expertise to offer uh, both their brother and sister and the system generally. Um, and they're passionate and want to share that. Um, and I think there's a way of us trying to, to capture some of that. And, and I think we're really fortunate here in having some amazing sibling volunteers and siblings who really want to get involved and, and change that picture. Um, so I think, and I think it was Kate that mentioned it earlier, that whole family approach is something we're really, really keen on um, and that still needs to be, be pushed forward. Uh, I can see there's also a comment in the chat about uh, siblings taking on the care and I think uh, later in life. And I think that's something that we see, well, it's a stage at which a lot of siblings contact us for support. It's that suddenly, a crisis has happened, you know, a, a parent has become ill, a parent has died, uh, and they're full thrust into a world of social care and health and, uh, and all, the, um, all, all the complexities that that brings and, and not knowing where to start. So yeah, a lot of the work we do is it around supporting adult siblings through that maze uh, and trying to help them find information, but also support them emotionally as well, because uh, again, as peers absolutely mentioned siblings so often don't think about their own health and and well-being and Thank Claire you. I sorry Liv and oh, Claire I, I, I wanted to note that over the COVID pandemic that whole um that being thrust into a crisis or suddenly that the crisis coming front and center we saw over the COVID pandemic becoming very uh, prominent and and perhaps for many people it felt like something that would be very very far away and then it just was suddenly right there so we certainly identify with that. Oh, I couldn't agree more it's what I, I've often referred to as the ticking time bomb effect for siblings you know that something's going to happen at some point in the future but it's that level of vigilance that I think that siblings have to have and for lots of siblings during the pandemic that time bomb went off all at the same time and of course that had an enormous effect on all of our services because again as small organizations trying to meet an enormous need um, that's a that's a really big pressure. I, I, I'm going to echo that and pick up on a theme we're seeing in, in the chat around um, siblings who are caring for or will be caring for their adult sibling and their aging parents at the same time and that that extra squeeze. Um, Katie, uh, I just want to let you comment on this question around um, unique needs of, of siblings. Yeah, I echo what um, the other panelists said. Um, I think what I'll add is also the long distance sibling caregiving role is something that needs more attention um, on what that looks like, how to do it, how to support siblings in that way. And then also the difficult decisions that families sometimes have to make about who moves, you know, when, when there's a crisis. Does the sibling uproot their whole family and their whole life and job and move to be with their brother or sister with a disability and or aging parents? Or does the person with a disability move and have to start their services all from square one and get on long waiting lists? And um, it's really difficult decisions um, related to long distance sibling caregiving and then um, transitions in that, that care um, that is important. Um, additionally, I think more focus on the needs of brothers is important. I think it's similar in the larger caregiving realm where, um, you know, there's a lot of focus on the, the, the mothers and um, the needs of fathers need to be looked at. And similarly, how can we really create our supports in a way that um, are meaningful to brothers? Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one more formal question, um, and then we're going to uh, to move to. We have some audience questions coming in already, and and please feel free to to put them in the in the Q and A. Um, so so given what we've been talking about, um, sort of this unique subset of needs, this 
this lifespan, this longer period of care, rather than maybe a more acute period of care that might come with aging or, or illness. Um, and these organizations that are often uh, small, uh, grassroots, um, growing, uh, but run by siblings and volunteers uh, to a large extent. Um, given all of that, what can um, caregiving organizations, um, disability organizations, healthcare uh, uh, organizations, um, what do they need to know about how to better support and include siblings in, in their services? Um, and um, I'm going to start with, um, with Claire. Thank you. Um, oh, so many things. Uh, where to start? Um, I think listening and understanding, actually. Uh, listen to siblings. I think that's the, the, the first thing that I would absolutely say. Um, you know, it isn't the same as other caregiving. Um, so often uh, we talk about young carers, for example, as, as all being the same. And actually, I think if you're a young sibling carer, it's different. You've got that lifelong element. Um, so I think it's really important to look at the nuances within caring. Um, I particularly like Katie's point about uh, caring from a distance, because uh, that's a, a, a workshop that we also ran last summer. Um, it was one of our uh, most well attended sessions and it, it was where a light bulb went off for so many siblings who for the first time understood that they were they were carers actually even if you live 150 miles away from your brother or sister you're still a carer if you're taking calls if you're managing care if you're dealing with emotional fallouts you know that's still caring and I think that actually for siblings that's that's quite a big step uh, to take um, I think that care giving organizations need to um, develop policies and practices that, to, that welcome siblings. I think so often siblings don't feel that they're included and, and can be involved in those, those organizations. They don't quite feel it's for them. Uh, so I think it's about pro providing an environment actually where, where siblings feel welcome, they feel understood, where their views are taken seriously, where they're felt that they've got something real and tangible to offer. Um, I think that, again, it's about choice. And I think there's something about those cultural aspects that siblings have a choice about their role that they play with their brother or sister, whether they are full-time carers, whether they choose not to have involvement. You know, for us as an organisation, we're with siblings at every point along that journey. Um, and I think that's really important. I think there's a level of expectation that siblings might give up their own dreams, ambitions um, to look after a brother or sister. And actually, it's OK to have your own life. It's OK to have your own dreams and ambitions. Um, and I think that that's a cultural shift, actually. And I think that, it again, it's a different role. I, I, that resonates so much. I'll just share. I was speaking yesterday with a, a sibling caregiver um, who was mentioning that he got into a, a university program of his dreams, but was really conflicted about whether to go because it's all the way across the country. Um, and those are the kinds of questions that that siblings are, are facing and all the attendant guilt and, and stress uh, around that. Um, Helen, over to you around what um, organizations need to know about um, serving and including and supporting this group. Yeah, I'd love to pick up on what Clara was saying and you as well, Liv. Uh, I, I've been in spaces where um, policy and decision makers uh, assume that a sibling is going to step into the caring role. And I just think it's just it's just so important that it's known that it is not our birthright to become a carer. And, um, and so that's where policies, service providing organizations need to, to step up. And um, I think providing better support uh, over, as we've mentioned so many times in this panel, over the lifetime can help um, make that um, you know, decision at that time a lot easier. Um, I also liked what Claire said about listening to siblings. So in my short journey, as compared to um, SLN and Sibs UK and the short journey of Siblings Canada, um, I certainly have felt that that 
we're, we are not listened to as siblings, we're not considered, or even might I dare say taken seriously, or that this care role is a very serious, um, um, a very serious role and uh, can be enormously disruptive if uh, we have to step into it very suddenly. So being listened to at all levels and, um, and uh, being offered choice and being welcomed into uh, different spaces. So um, those are the things that I think are particularly important. Um, I, I also wanted to pick up on that, that cultural piece. So Canada is a very diverse country. We have a, a lot of different family systems and um, I guess it fits in a little bit with that choice piece as well that uh, you know, we need to be able to cater to all siblings or be able to um, at least understand the complexity of a culture in family systems and what that means for providing care, specifically sibling care. Katie, um, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I, I want to echo what um you know, the other panelists have said at the SLN in the USA, we've seen that most caregiving organizations focus on parents. Um, and while the sibling experience has some similarities to parents, the experience of siblings is unique. Um, you know, often there's this idea, Piyush was uh, talking about this, that, and, and Helen as well, that the siblings are going to step into their parents' shoes to care for their brother or sister with a disability in the future. However, I do not want to become my mother and my sister doesn't want another person to mother her. <laughs> and we want to provide care while maintaining our sibling relationship. This is not easy and we need more examples of what it looks like and how to do it. Caring, caregiving organizations uh, can help siblings, um, help include siblings in the future planning by having information and resources available for families to start that difficult dialogue about planning for the future. They can acknowledge that siblings may have different ideas for the future than their parents and help really create a space for families to talk in a way where everyone can have a voice and a choice in the process. One simple thing I think uh, for caregiving organizations is just in the language that's used uh, to be more inclusive of siblings. Um, using inclusive terms, saying family and really meaning the whole family, or maybe even specifically adding the word sibling or brother or sister to help you remember that that's what it is and to, you know, advertise to everyone else that uh, siblings are welcome when you talk about families. And then you could also find siblings in your country and community that you intentionally invite to get their ideas and feedback to help be more inclusive of siblings. Asking that siblings themselves is the best way to learn. And as Claire said, listening to siblings. Thank you. Wonderful. And Piyush, um, over to you for your perspective on this. Yes. So I think in India, like we do have caregiving, caregiving organizations, but mostly uh, we are still very family oriented. So the caregiving is done entirely by the family and there are lots of parent organizations. So there's the tension between the what parent wants, what the person with disability wants, and then there comes the sibling in the middle, like somehow juggling the two spheres. So uh, I think for the caregiving organ organizations, like everyone said, it's important that our voices should be heard and they invite us to know what goes in our mind or what is our perspective. And also it, uh, what I'm personally seeing uh, in India, whatever the uh, disability organizations space is there, uh, it's it's uh, they are not uh, they are touching the sibling aspect but it's only like uh, kind of a lip service type of thing it's not it's just like we just have to do this on a checklist and just move so that we can so show something on our social media and maybe get the funding so that's what uh, works behind the uh, ngos there and uh, i uh, i hope that uh, this thing uh, they take us seriously and like we get uh, uh, many platforms to like, uh, like uh, uh, express what, what is going on inside of them, yeah. And uh, I'm gonna use moderator's privilege to just add one more um, element, which is we know we don't have enough data on the specifics of, of sibling caregiving and, and really making sure that, um, that we support research um, into the sibling experience, I think um, is really important. 
Uh, we have lots of questions uh, pouring in on both the, the chat and the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, sort of let uh, the formal moment here of asking each of you uh, every question uh, fall away and we can sort of go popcorn style. Um, I'm just going to start pulling some of these questions. Um, Katie, I see you're typing an answer to one of them. Thank you. Uh, Donna Thompson has a question about preparing um, a child sibling to be a future power of attorney uh, for their their brother. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has has thoughts on how to manage that um, and resources around that. So feel free to unmute and, and jump in. Uh, Siblings Canada just put out a, a new guide on uh, communicating with family and also host, uh, we're part of a webinar on the same topic. And we're really trying to get across the importance of starting those conversations um, early and having them on an ongoing basis on what does it mean to be a POA or what does it mean um, for any other kind of future planning uh, discussions and really trying to get through that. That's It's not one discussion at one time, but it's like, an ongoing discussion held over, frankly, a lifetime, and um, tr trying to see what that looks like as things change. Uh, okay, thank you, Helen. Um, we have a question about the sort of the kinds of programs and activities, uh, the balance between um, programs that are specific to siblings, uh, sibling carers or caregivers, and programs that bring together um, the sibling who's receiving care and the sibling who's providing care, um, where where that balance is, it's it's a question from Andy McGowan. I hope I've I've um, represented it uh, well, but I'm wondering um, uh, what your thoughts are on on sort of the balance of of those needs, both the need for validation and support separately, and the need for programs that bring um, bring together the the sibling pair. Um, I'll come in that we uh, at SIBS, we don't bring siblings together with their disabled brother or sister. That's our activities are focused primarily on, on siblings to have that opportunity to come together with other siblings. I think one of the things that we have noticed though, and I'm talking to some other sort of care organizations and grassroots services is one of the things that siblings really want, and I can resonate with this from my childhood, is what they really want is some time alone with a parent. So time alone with a, a, a mum or dad or adult carer um, and have that space together and, and, and know that their brother or sister has a nice activity to do. Um, there was a, a recently an organisation who did a survey expecting that siblings would want to do really nice activities with their disabled brother or sister, but they didn't. What they really wanted was that precious time with a, a parent that doesn't happen very often uh, for siblings. Uh, quite often, you know, uh, activities are focused on their brother or sister or activities are focused on things that their brother or sister can get involved in. So I think we also need to think about those types of activities as well. So much of our identity gets tied into our brother and sister. And just in our own neighborhood, I'm only ever Paul's sister. I'm not really sure if anybody knows my name. So it's just been like that my whole life. So I really, really echo what you say, Claire. Um, we're seeing lots of great resources in the chat as well. So do, uh, do look into there. Uh, question for everyone on um, how sibling uh, can be siblings can be brought more into um, the care support team at all ages, um, whether it's the medical team or a broader team. Um, how can siblings be included, um, and what can those teams do to uh, to better include? This is Katie. Um, maybe I'll say the first thing might be to ask uh, the the person with a disability if they want their sibling to be included or not, and then to ask the sibling. Um, if they would like to have a role and to explain what that role would be and help prepare uh, the sibling at whatever age for uh, the role. Uh, because as um, was mentioned before, siblings have a lot of insight and insider information, especially navigating like peer situations um, in school settings and things like that. Um, they know the inside scoop of which bathroom to avoid and how to get, you know, to a certain classroom in a quicker way and all of these different things that can really be valuable um, for 
those types of, of um, team meetings. Um, so ask and prepare. All right. I am getting the, the wrap up signal. So I'm officially going to move into the wrap up. And I just want to note, um, there's so much um, rich work that each of your organizations uh, is doing. And, and I'm very excited about the prospect, uh, the seed that was planted today about an international conference or an international summit, because I think we have so much more to learn from each other. And I think that organizations like mine that have a, a more um, broad view of caregiving um, and, and within that family, Siblings Canada is, is situated, have so much to learn about specific support for siblings. Um, so, so grateful to, to all the work um, that all of you are doing. We know with, with blood, sweat and tears and um, hopeful about a landscape um, that better supports organizations doing this work. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I want to echo Liv's thanks. And also thank you, Liv, for, for organizing this panel and, and bringing all of you to, to connect with all of us. Um, I see that there's some questions um, still coming in through the chat. And our panelists have shared some contact information, um, web links, resources. Um, I also saw some Facebook pages and other ways that you can connect with them, connect with the work that they do. Um, so take a look. You might have to scroll up in the chat um, for the ways that you can stay connected with them and continue this conversation. Um, but thank you to this panel for that, for that fabulous conversation and introduction to this topic. We appreciate it. We have reached the point in our day where we're getting ready to take a little bit of a break from our program. Um, but before we do, we did want to go ahead and share that care story that we passed over um, just to make sure we were on time for this live panel. Um, and that's Jean's story. And before we hear from Jean, we'll play Jean's story as we go to break. We want to take a quick peek at Twitter because all of you are sending um, some pretty great stories and photos to us to be part of this conversation and our Global Voices of Caring project on Twitter. Um, so thank you to Credit for Caring for sharing this photo. Um, of a road trip with mom. Um, that is a great image for a future that includes carers. Um, and it looks like a lot of fun. And Andy earlier today shared his carer story. Um, Andy wrote, here is my carer story. The top photos are for when I cared for both of my parents with a range of physical and mental, Ill mental health issues. I started caring when I was six. Now working for a carer's charity to try and raise awareness and improve support for carers of all ages. So thanks, Andy, for sharing those photos and that story with us. So as we go to break here, um, just a few reminders. Um, if you are on Facebook Live, you can leave that live stream open during break. You can also leave it and come back. We'll be here when you come back from break at 12.15 p.m. Eastern time. If you're on Zoom, the same applies. You can keep the Zoom meeting open. We'll keep it open on our end. Or you can click away from it and come back and rejoin us at 12.15 Eastern time using that same um, join information and link that was emailed to you. So with that, um, we're going to hear a story from Jean in Taiwan. Jean talks a little bit about how she practices self-care uh, to keep herself strong um, as a caregiver. And I hope that as you take a little break from this program, um, that you're able to also take a bit of respite and care. We'll be back in a bit. Hello to everyone and greetings from Taiwan. My name is Jin Lin. I am a caregiver from Taipei, Taiwan. I would like to share my caregiving story about me and my dear parents. When my parents' health declined in the 80s, I stepped forward with caring duties it's a process of constant learning, learning to cope with the unpredictable and uncontrollable. It is a full-time responsibility that requires high levels of vigilance. 
it creates physical and psychological strain over extended periods of time. Fortunately, in the hustle and bustle metropolis of Taipei, there is great support and tremendous positive energy for the carers. I am always learning from and sharing with my fellow carers on how to care for myself while caring for my loved one. I always appreciate a brief moment of respite from the daily routine. Maybe a walk through the lantern lightings in the Lunar New Year. A look at the beautiful hydrangea of the flower season. Or an exercise session in long-term care facility. They all give me a sense of relief and enjoyment. They help me to forget about the trials and tribulations, and I feel much more empowered. <laughs>